Yes, madam, you can start sharing your slide. Hello, Dr. Ishwarya. Just you can start your presentation, madam. You can start sharing on the screen. It is not open now. Yes, it's going to start. So. I am Dr. Ashura Kuru and I am the Associate Professor of Sergei Dharasar Khan Institute and the College of Arts in Nagpur. I am also the course director and the founder of Clinical Implant Excellence Academy. So, this is my beautiful college where I have been working and with my staff, the students. So, I ask you the lifelong most that you will ever have in your mind. And what you so, let's start with my topic. We are going to discuss about the partial extraction therapy in the implant dentistry. So why it is so important? There is a bucko palatal collapse. There is a bucko palatal collapse of the post-extraction bridge is of significant challenge to the restorative and implant dentistry. The resorption from the alveolar ridge commands immediately post-extraction and is most pronounced on the buccal aspect. Fletches after three months of healing and may result in as much as 50% of loss of residual bridge. So, what do you understand by partial extraction therapy? Partial extraction therapy represents a subgroup of pre collapse intervention that collectively use the tooth itself to offset the loss of alveolar tissue by retaining the tooth through. And an attachment to the bone and button bone feeding complex with a vascular supply that is to be maintained. So, what are the various partial extraction techniques? The first is the socket shoe technique, second is the root submergence technique, and third is the contact shoe technique. So, what are the biologic rationale behind using the partial extraction therapy? So, first let's understand the biology of the bone. Alveolar bone is made up of two processes. First is the alveolar process and second is the alveolar bone drop. Alveolar process of the jaw bones and eunuch is developed from the teeth and along with the eruption of the teeth and is dependent on the presence of the teeth for its maintenance, undergoing autophagy once the tooth is lost. So in the alveolar bone proper, that provides the attachments of the sharpie fibers to the of the period from the period and this arrange in the bundle and dietate calcified which is now called as the bundle bone. The buccal bone plate is supplied by the blood supply of periodontal ligament, blood supply of the alveolar bone and and the loss of tooth will compromise if the blood supply and this leads to the loss. So now let's come to the histological evidences of partial extraction. It was first reported by Philippi Atal in 2001, where he uh, said about the decoronation of the tooth 
in order to preserve the rich. In 2007, Salama et al. Just hold on. So Salama et al. He uh, gave the root submergence technique. He introduced the root submergence technique and he uh, introduced the advantage and disadvantage of using the root submergence technique. They provided in 2009. He introduced the unconventional way of uh, uncolored root fragment, which is retained. It also can be used as a pontic site. Hasler et al. He described the socket shield technique. In 2000, Bomber et al. He gave the socket shield technique. And he still upon the first histological, clinical, and volumetric observation after using the socket shield technique. In 2013, Pan he described the proximal socket shield technique for interimplant papillary preservation in the aesthetic world. In 2014, Glockeret, he gave the modified way of socket shield technique. Glockman in 2016, he gave the main partial extraction therapy. And he can divide it into part one and part two. So now we will see about the various indications of where partial exception therapy comes through submergence technique. It is used in unresolvable tooth ground or the tooth for extraction, absence of a pivot pathology, plan for removable full and partial processes, plan contact site banana processes, and can be can be loose used as a cantilever or as a pontic site and it can be used as an alternative to the two adjacent teeth. Then comes to the socket shield technique. Again, the indication I'm mostly saying is unresolvable to drawn or the tooth for extraction. Tooth root without any apical pathology, which is very important. Intention to preserve the alveolar ridge. Then the pontic shield technique. This is again same like the root submergence technique. And it can be also used as a pattern context site to connect the process. Then the proximal socket shield technique. This is used in the case where we have to uh, retain our interradical, proximal interradical tool. So we can go with the proximal socket shield technique. Hello. Get up, Kaishu. We are getting a discount from your side. So, shall we go with the alternate speaker? We invite Dr. Priyanka Tiwari from. Hello. Yeah, hi. Yes, madam, you can go with the. Uh, you can start presenting. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. As sure. There is a, a 
internet problem from Dr. Yes. Uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, I will just be doing it. Yes. yes. We have a lot of time, Madam, just you can take your own time. Sure, just give me a few seconds. Yes. I'm uh, sharing. Yeah. I would like to inform you, Dr. Dr. Priyanka Tiwari is from Sumandi Vidya Pitch Vidya University from Malaysia as one of the keynote speakers for this conference. The title of the talk will be the comparative evolution of musculatory efficiency of roots supported by attachment retained of overdenture and implement support of overdenture by EMG Anina and Viva, Viva study. Uh, yeah, uh, so good afternoon to one and all. Uh, yeah, so I'll be starting with my presentation. Yes. Uh, yes, and I'm Dr. Priyanka and I'm a prosthodontist. Uh, Sorry, uh, just a second, please. Um, okay, uh, so sorry for that. I think there's some uh, internet issues. Uh, okay, so first of all, I would like to tell you all that being edentulous is considered a handicap, both with respect to oral function and, you know, uh, psychological, it has a big psychological impact. So, uh, you understand that if we are edentulous, there's a lot of issues with mastication, with aesthetics, with basically, uh, you know, chewing the food and basically speech, all the basic oral functions. Okay, so the topic, uh, yeah. So as uh, rightly said by him, uh, my topic is a comparative ev evaluation of a masticatory efficiency of root supported attachment retained over denture and implant supported over denture. So it's an, you know, it's an in vivo study, which I had done. So um, uh, I have uh, done a study. Uh, so just let's go to the contents and I'll tell you in detail. So we'll, in my presentation, you'll be able to see introduction, methodology, observation results, discussion, conclusion, limitation, and references. Uh, okay, so starting with the presentation. Um, so masticatory force is around, you know, 20% to 40% in a complete denture wearer. So those are the people who don't have teeth present in the mouth. So, uh, you know, compared to a healthy dentate individual. So, um, of course, you can already see that, you know, our masticatory force has been reduced. So there are rapid developments in implantology, which is like the preservation of natural tooth or root. So that is the D1 victim. So dictum. So uh, that is when you are supposed to preserve the normal tooth or root in the mouth. Uh, so coming to the concept of overdenture, so it's any removal den dental processes that uh, covers or rests on one or more remaining teeth, either in a form of root or as an implant. So again, I'll be discussing or dentures in two to three forms in my presentation. Uh, so in 1970s, there was this introduction for implants uh, and in 1980s, implant retained or denture came into play. Uh, so defining masticatory efficiency. So that is the number of strokes needed to achieve a certain particle reduction. Uh, so there can be some methods to, you know, check the masticatory efficiency. That is the ultrasonography, photo, uh, colorimetry and sieve method, and also the EMG activity, which I'm going to highlight in this presentation. Uh, oral function improves significantly after fabrication of a mandibular implant supported denture. Uh, also, it needs 1.5 to 3.6 times fewer chewing strokes than a conventional complete denture. So, uh, you know, it uh, it's a better at reducing the particle size of the food and it's better at chewing and making the size of the food small. So it will help in the chewing and the digestion and you know the further procedures process. Um, so uh, there is uh, basically uh, 200, so uh, maximum masticatory force of an implant retained denture is 60% to 200% greater than a conventional denture. So you can already see that, you know, 
you know, the masticatory force has increased a lot if we are uh, placing an implant together with an overtension. Uh, so uh, that's why I have used this in my treatment planning. Uh, so muscle activity of the masseter and the tempor temporalis is basically checked in the EMG activity here. Um, Again, electromyography, that is EMG, is recording an analysis of elect electrical potential of the muscles of mastication. So I'm using, I'm, I'm checking two muscles of mastication because others are too deep to be checked. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, uh, we are evaluating and recording this uh, electromyography or the jaw muscles during the muscle so coming to the method methodology, so what I did was I divided the patients into two groups. Uh, that was complete dentures and implant supported over denture. Uh, the other one was root supported uh, denture and root supported attachment retained over denture. So what I did was I converted the complete into implant and I completed, I, I converted the root supported into root supported attachment, attachment retained. So by that I did four treatments in my procedure. Um, okay, so five patients were, uh, you know, designated in each of the groups, and of course, you know, it was, so there were total 10 patients, and it was followed by the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. So as you can see, there are different inclusion and exclusion. So inclusion criteria for implant support over nature was it, the first patient should be totally edentulous uh, for at least past six months, no oral pathology, any disease, no radiotherapy, uh, you know, whatsoever um, history, uh, no residual uh, bone volume remaining. Okay, the least which should be remaining is 5 mm uh, in diameter and 10 mm in length. Uh, of course, patients of class one, two, three, those are the types of bones are to be considered. Inclusion for the root supported attachment retained over denture was patient with completely edentulous uh, maxillary arch and with bilateral presence of uh, canine. So we really require the canines in a root supported over denture implant uh, cases. Uh, so uh, patients should have an adequate inter arch space, uh, healthy. Uh, periodontium should be available. Exclusion criteria for implant supported over denture is in uh, you know insufficient bone, of course, will not be tolerated as we don't have sufficient uh, bone surface to implant you know, put the implants. Uh, severe intermaxillary skeletal discrepancy uh, cannot be uh, is not useful as it's going to interfere in our implant placement. Gag reflex uh, would be an exclusion criteria. Severe clenching, any habits that is the bruxism. Uh, heavy smoking, so all these were in the exclusion. So exclusion criteria for the root supported attachment retained over denture was patient with bad periodontal status and endodontic status, because as we are supposed to, you know, uh, put the attachment in the root, so we need a proper endodontic treatment done if there was any, and a patient with grossly destructive teeth were also excluded. So uh, and now I'll be showing you these photos. So what these are is, um, uh, for our group one patients in phase one, there was fabrication of conventional complete denture. So these are just the basic steps. So I took a primary impression, a primary cast, then final impression, master cast, cast was uh, you know, a poured. Um, jaw relations were done. Facebook transfer was also done. Um, teeth arrangement was done, and then denture insertion uh, was done. And as you can see, the denture is in the mouth. So coming to the surgical stent fabrication and the procedure. So what, what I did was I duplicated the maxillary denture. Then again, I what I did was I put the modeling wax poured on the you know mandibular side and uh, uh, you know uh, I used uh, like uh, a radio opaque material and uh, I uh, put the surgical stent you know mandible mandibular denture base into place and then later I you know uh, put the same, I did the same thing for the uh, maxillary, you know, denture base. And that's how my surgical stent was, uh, you know, uh, made. So the surgical stent helps in uh, taking a CT scan, um, you know, CBCT, uh, uh, a CT scan of the patient when uh, after we are doing the plan, I'm sorry, before we are doing the planning of the patient. So like you can see, the CT scan has been done and uh, you can see the radio opaque, uh, you know, teeth and the bone inside uh, the scan. And uh, it can be appreciated as, uh, you know, the material is radio opaque and we can plan uh, and you can also see the bone there. So we can plan how exactly the, you know, uh, occlusion is going to be. Um, so because this is a copy of my original denture. Uh, okay. So 
uh, that's what it was done. And uh, other than that, uh, then we started with the crystal incision and we started with the implant, uh, basically implant placement phase. That is, we gave a crystal incision, then placed a surgical stent at the location. So I started with the first drill uh, coming to the figure 22. Uh, so that is the, uh, I had put a paralleling pin, um, you know, uh, in the surface where I was supposed to place implants. Those are basically the canine regions. Uh, then cover screw was placed. A denture was relined in place. A gingival mm -hmm. former from uh, canine to canine region was, um, uh, you know, placed in the, uh, in the location. And uh, you can see a pickup impression was made. And uh, then the pickup, uh, the attachment was you know, the implant was placed on uh, the uh, canine regions. Uh, coming to the fabrication of root supported uh, overdenture, that was the phase three. So what we did was uh, we put the stud in the place, uh, you know, in occlusion. And uh, you can see implant supported overdenture, uh, implant supported, uh, you know, uh, denture was in place. Uh, then coming to the fabrication of the root supported uh, overdenture, sorry, it was from figure 30. So that is from teeth, but teeth was reduced from one to two mm above the gingival margin. Space was created for an attachment pin to be placed. Access post was cemented and O-ring pickup impression with the self-care was made. So that's how we finished our treatment planning for all the phases. Now in phase four, what I did was uh, fabrication of the root supported attachment retained overdenture. So um, again, uh, OPG was taken and attachment retained, uh, uh, att uh, attachment retained, uh, you know, overdenture was placed in the mouth. Uh, now I started with recording the EMG activity. So I use the surface electrodes and uh, EMG machine you can see in the photo is you know shown. Uh, EMG of the temporalis was uh, you know in the forehead area. Uh, EMG of the masseter was at the angle of the mandible. So these were the location and I just tried to highlight the location for you all to better understand. So procedure so it had uh like you can you had seen in the earlier photo there was a disc um you know with an electrode which was 10 mm in diameter and the material it is made up of is agcl material was used and of course we recorded two of the muscles that was the masseter and the temporal temporalis then the reference electrode and measuring egg Electrode was also attached by the tape to the patient's mouth. Uh, everything was cleared. The skin was, uh, you know, degreased with alcohol, and uh, uh, electrode gel was applied for the smooth uh, movement of the, you know, uh, readings. Uh, reading was done in every five to six minutes. Um, by the help of the software, of course, you know, I could take out the maximum voluntary contraction. That is the MVC. Uh, and uh, that is when the patient clinched and uh, when the patient was doing mastication. So the second phase was while the patient was doing mastication, I uh, also checked the masseter and temporalis of both the sides and I gave the patient 10 grams of penis to two. Uh, for 20 strokes for one minute. So uh, these things have to be standardized as a uh, it's a standardized protocol uh, to standardize material and then uh, I did the recording of the EMG. So you can see in the observation and results uh, that uh, group one, you know, EMG uh, values during clinching was, you know, as follows. And uh, of course, EMG while clinching were as follows for the other group. Uh, so highest you can highlight and see that, uh, you know, in the range of 9,000 something, uh, you know, uh, in implant retained over dentures, you can see the readings coming even while clinching uh, you know, for the implant supported overdenture. And even you can see uh, when you compare, with, you can see higher values when you compare root supported attachment retained from a conventional root supported over retained dentures. So basic highlights for that implant retained overdenture did well. And then was the root supported attachment retained denture. Okay, so same study was again carried out. Uh, I mean, sorry, same readings I got. Uh, I mean, I, I plotted down again my readings in during the masticatory, um, you know, uh, phase. And uh, what I found out was uh, that uh, implant retained overdenture was, uh, you know, uh, higher in, uh, much higher in implant retained overdenture, uh, the readings for mastication while the patient was chewy. And then coming again to the root supported attachment retained over denture, and then the conventional root supported, and then the conventional. 
So you can see the main clenching activity for both the muscle groups here. The highest is the IOD, that is the implant uh, supported over denture. Uh, okay, so this was in mastication. Again, uh, we can see that the winner here is the implant supported over denture. Okay, so these were the other respective findings and uh, stats shows that, uh, you know, the results were uh, quite significant as they were less than 0 0.0.1. Yeah, that was the p-value. Uh, same with my table in mastication that was for clenching. Uh, so these were for all different groups. So, uh, okay, so in the present study, the AMG results were calculated in the mu volts. And that's how, you know, we calculate the, you know, EMG uh, values. And uh, you can see, again, that the highlight is the IOD had the highest one. And then coming to the implant retained, uh, the attachment retained over denture had the second highest. Same was with the clenching activity. Um, okay, so coming to the discussion. So uh, what happens is... Um, when we compare different different studies, so which is the EMG study, the you know uh, what happens? I mean, why did I actually choose to do it? Was this was the best method to choose uh, to check the masticatory efficiency of muscle contraction? As what happens is the muscle contraction increases, so the EMG value becomes. Uh, higher, it gives a higher result, and which shows that you know the processes on a you know uh, whatever uh, muscles I'm testing is having a good retention. So that's why I choose the EMG study, uh, that is the electromyography. Uh, the mandibular arch was chosen. It absorbs, uh, it, you know, it uh, you know, sorry, it resorbs more compared to the maxilla. So that's why we plan to study and improve the. Um, you know, the problem of resorption of the mandibular ridge. Basically, that's why I chose the, you know, mand mandible uh, rather than a maxillary study. Uh, why was CT and OPG done? So here you can see that, you know, I used a radiopaque template uh, for like taking the, you know, the CT scan. And so it helped me measure the implant diameters. OPG was also used because we wanted to eliminate any, uh, you know, uh, pathosis, anatomical limitations of, uh, you know, the uh, placements. Uh, canines used in the study as they are richly innervated and they have long roots and they are in the mouth for a longer time. So they do have a good uh, PDL support. Um, peanuts. On, you know, were used because uh, they are like the non-synthetic, hard, soluble material, material, and they are the standard for you know a masticatory uh, study, which is supposed to be used. Uh, okay, coming to the stud attachment, the axis post uh, was placed, and a small vertical space was uh, you know. Uh, there, so it allowed the rotation of the attachment. Uh, so that's why we did use a stud attachment, which is the ball attachment in the study. Uh, masseter and temporalis muscle was used because you know they do work together in the masticatory muscles, and they can be palpated, and they are not so deep. So that is the most important thing. Um, other than that, uh, two implants have been used. Uh, so two implants are used because uh, you know. They, they do occupy less space and it's easier to maintain and clean them. Uh, they're less expensive and uh, they're less chair time and less expertise required. And of course they are, you know, good satisfaction, which can be present. They're easier to do rather than putting like a big, you know, attachment, um, big, big uh, meaning more implants with more attachments. So there are some six studies which I briefly, you know, enumerated here. So survival, survival rate was 95% to 100% for two to four implants, 81% uh, for one implant. So you can see if you are placing two to four implants, the survival rate is more. So that's why I chose place so two implants and the, you know, maintenance complication, replacement of loose clips, or implants. So those things are a little troublesome and, uh, you know, they would create inconvenience for the patients as well. So that's why we stressed on placing two implants and not three or four. So uh, the last point there in the six studies you can see is two or four best, uh, best for overdenture is a term in terms of comfort and function is the best way to, you know, uh, 
go about in uh, you know overdenture study. Uh, so Don Sky uh, is a scientist who you know they, these are the scientists. I'm just going to enumerate how they you know I took reference from my studies for. So two ball overdentures were giving 97 98% success. So that's he also did some study which you know had two ball overdentures. Uh, Liu et al. So he did an EMG study of normal muscles. And uh, so I could get a reference that yes, and basically he did use, uh, you know, these temporalis and masseter. Again, Kuhn et al. also did the same thing. He used the temporalis and masseter. Uh, and uh, of course, he found out that IOD was giving more result and see the complete denture was giving less result. Uh, again, now coming to the other one is build. So build is, uh, you know, ability of soft food uh, could be same for IOD and CD. Masticatory function, on the other hand, for implant supported over denture, that is IOD, is more than the complete denture. So bite force doubled when placement of implant was placed in the mandibular denture. So he, they also kind of confirmed whatever I have done in my study. Uh, coming to uh, Carvazzo, um, so he uh, did a two clenching test with few dentures and recording of EMG of a mastication, masticatory muscles. So again, he he found out that masticatory was giving a higher result and temporal you know, was on the lower side. So as we know that, you know, masseter would do the maximum work in the uh, mastication of our, you know, uh, in the mastication process. Uh, so that also confirmed that. Uh, Lepod, um, another scientist, so what he did was, as muscles contract, it equals to the electrical activity increasing. So we could see that there was more contraction in the masseter muscles when we were doing the chewing as they were giving the higher results. So Fenn, another scientist, uh, you know, uh, did and study on EMG of IOD, which is equal to mandibular fixed implant supported over denture. So he said that uh, either you do an fixed implant supported over denture or IOD, it's it, relatively the same thing. Again, so these uh, scientists, uh, the uh, Tem uh, Am uh, scientists, uh, did another study which showed that, uh, you know, overdenture is close to a dented patient activity than a complete denture. So overdenture is better than giving, uh, if you can, of course. Uh, it's always better in giving uh, overdenture than a complete denture. Uh, Karwas is it told us that uh, you know masseter works better for hard food than soft food. Another scientist proved that uh, masseter shows higher potential than temporalis. Uh, Talgan uh, said that there is increase in mastication in IOD rather than CD. So of course, again, so all are highlighting that implant supported overdenture is working better. Okay, so those were the discussions. Now coming to a very general comparisons, why I did what I did in my study. Then complete denture, we really saw like a summary. So we really saw that there was a decrease in the EMG activity. And yes, because there was a weakening of masticatory muscles. Uh, aging, of course, modified the neurofunctional control and mastication. That's why the mucosal receptors work and function of the PDL was lost. Um, in root supported overdenture, canines helped in the chewing process, and implant overdenture. Uh, in on in the implant overdenture, um, there were active remote uh, proprioceptors by transmission of vibration by the facial muscles. So uh, that's why they were giving higher results uh, in the EMG activity, and there was mucosal support which offer additional neural input to stimulation of the mucosal, uh, you know, extra, uh, you know, extra receptors. And that there was the result of the PDL playing a better role in implant supported overdenture. Uh, okay, so coming to the conclusion. Uh, so results indicated that, um, uh, indicated a stat statistically significant difference in the masticatory efficiency between four treatments. So of course that was, uh, P value is less than 0 0.001. Uh, okay, so again, it just says all this was that implant supported over denture showed a better activity uh, than the other um, uh, treatment uh, treatments in the group. Uh, so within the limitation of the study, it can be inferred that uh, placing two implants in the mandibular canine region improves the masticatory efficiency and gives us uh, benefits in the long term. Um, 
so the results of the study also correspond well with the macrill concerns uh, statement as uh, you know on overdenture uh, uh, which concluded that the restoration of the edentulous mandible with a complete denture is no longer the most appropriate first choice uh, prosthodontic treatment but there is currently enough evidence to support a concept of co implant or denture which can be the first choice so you can see that you know this is also uh, something which i have proven in my study so coming to the, just the last few slides so it's like the limitations of my study i have uh, after done the study i realized that yes it can be improved in the future if anyone wants to do the study or if i want to continue it later on um so first limitation would be an unequal distribution of patients with respect to the gender in the group uh so yeah that was something which might have altered the results a second is that a longer term evaluation may be better for confirming the masticatory efficiency um a compare a comparison could have been done on comparing the best direct method like sieve method and the emt uh, to get more precise results uh, so uh, there are some indirect and direct method of to check mastication so sieve method is one of the classical old methods to check uh, you know the mastication Uh, masticatory force uh, in a patient so again a comparison can be done and then the a qol a survey can be taken out you know of finding the quality of life of a patient after doing comparative study so the, on the screen you can just see that uh, these are how the emg studies uh, look like on the screen i took the snapshots of them and uh, you can see the highest one here is the uh, uh, you know 17700 Three two, uh, um, uh, you know, micro wall. That is the implant supported over denture. And uh, thank you for patience listening. And uh, yes, these are my references. Yeah. Yes. 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 Any questions? Yes. Any questions to Doctor Priyanka Tiwari? just if you have any questions you can text in chat box we'll be asking the of you if you have any internet problem from your side i think no questions madam <laughs> is it now i may have thank you thank you very much madam for participating in this event on behalf of organizing committee member of dental science as well as oral health congress 2021 we want thank you for your excellent presentation Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meet again next time. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much for me as a keynote. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just if if everything goes well in 2021 as well as 2022, we can meet with physical event so that we can share the dental science sure. all of us. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you sure. very much. Have a nice day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. We invite Knox. Next, we invite Dr. Ashwarya Tatu from Sarvia Dada Sahib. I'll make a smooth it in time and college from India to start the presentation. Yes. As due to some technical problems, yes. just yes. So is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. So good afternoon to all. I am Dr. Ashwara Kudu, and I am the associate so professor of surgery at the Kamis Smooth It Dental College and Hospital. I am the course director and founder of Clinical Implant Excellence Center. so we are coming to the to the uh, topic which i am going to discuss about the partial extraction therapy in implant therapy why this is so important because the buccal palate collapse of the post extraction breach is a significant challenge to the restorative and implant dentistry and the alveolar alveolar ridge coming immediately the resorption of alveolar ridge coming immediately post extraction and it is more pronounced in the buccal aspect and its plateaus is increased within the 3 month of healing and may result in 56% of loss of the residual ridge so now what do you understand by partial extraction therapy partial extraction therapy represents the subgroup of pre collapse intervention which is collectively used the tooth itself to offset the loss of alveolar tissue by retaining the tooth root and its attachment to the bone the buccal bone and pedal complex with its vascular supply is also maintained 
So there are three techniques of partial extraction therapy, structural techniques, root subjective technique, and the potential technique. What are the biologic? Now we are coming towards the biologic rationale of using partial extraction therapy. So first we need to know the work biology of alveolar bone. So alveolar bone is made up of two processes, alveolar process and alveolar bone proper. So alveolar process is very unique in the jawbone. It developed for the tooth and along with the eruption of the tooth, and it depends on the presence of its teeth for its maintenance. Once the tooth is lost, it undergo a trophy. So now coming to bundle bone. What do you understand by bundle bone? Alveolar bone proper provides the attachments of the sharpy fiber from the pit, uh, periodontal ligaments and they get calcified. And this calcified bone is called as a bundle bone. As we all know, the buccal bone get blood supply from the periodontal ligament, from alveolar bone and the, from the perostal. So periodontal ligaments is a key player in maintaining the viability of the bundle bone as well as the outer cortex. And the loss of tool will come to compromise the blood supply and can lead to the loss of bone. So there are just certain historical evidences starting from 2001 to 2016 to Klipman et al. He gave the, uh, in general, the partial extraction therapy. And he described all the three techniques, all the four techniques of the partial extraction therapy. So these are the various partial extraction therapy roots, submergent, socket shield, quantum shield, and the proximal socket shield. So these are the various indications, and most indications are common indications for all. And the roots submergence and the quantum shield technique are can be used as a cantilever quantum side, can as an alternative to, uh, to adjacent plant. While the other socket shield and the proximal socket shield can be used in case. Uh, in adjunct with the immediate implant placement. So now coming to the socket shield technique. What do you understand by socket shield technique? It was first described by Hugler et al. in 2010. And the principle behind using socket shield linkage is to safeguard my buccal plate and by creating the shield there. So here the fascial root section remains in situ with the physiologic relations to the buccal plate remains intact. Periodontal attachment apparatus and its vascularization of the tooth root is intended to remain wider and unharmed to prevent post extraction alveolar bone loss and to support the shield. So, what are the various guidelines? First is the no apical area of the tooth muscle remain. Shield should be stable and completely immobile, and shield should be thin enough to avoid any contact between the shield and the implant. You can see in the diagram this is here the tooth shield. That is, this is a buccal shield. The shield should be optimally thick that can resist the detachment from the libel plate. So, coming to case selection and the risk assessment. So, there are certain clinical assessment one must keep in mind before selecting your case. So, the first is your lip line, tooth position, three gingival markings, gingival biotype, scalar gingival markings, and the tooth sheet. Interproximal height of the bone, infection at the implant site and your or to your adjacent uh, tooth, available restorative space. So now case selection and risk assessment. There is also radiological assessment. So Glukman et al. also gave the radial plane to position of anterior tooth, and he gave this classification. In class 1, the tooth is positioned within the house, alveolar housing. Class 2A is the tooth is retroclined within the thick labial plate. Class 2B, the tooth is retroclined within the thin labial plate. In class 3, retroclined tooth with a thick palatal and a thin labial plate. Class 4, where the tooth is fascially positioned. And class fit tooth is between the thin fashion and the palatal bone. So class fourth and class fifth is completely contraindicated for partial extraction therapy. So now coming to our momentum for partial extraction therapy, you can go with the long shank carbide burr, round burr, football shape diamond burr. You can see here this is football shape burr, zikaria gingival retractors, artery forceps, and burr curettes. These are the various customized kits for partial extraction therapy. You can go with the Brassler, Megagan, Comat. 
So what are the step-by-step -step protocols for undergoing the solid shield technique? Your first section, your tooth, shield is prepared, replace your implant, manage the gap between your implant and the shield, and then the closure. So this is the step-by-step -step way, graphical representation of how you should do it. Section your tooth here. And then section the tooth is done to separate the labile part from the palatal part. You're removing the palatal part of the root. And then you can prepare your shield. Then you place your implant. There should be three directional implant placement. In measured in distant buccolingual and a picocorolan dimension is very, very important to achieve for optimum in emergence of final restoration. So this is how I'm placing my implant and closure. When it comes to the closure, you can customize your healing apartment in order to create the gene double emergencies. You can place a cover screw if you want, depend on the cases. So this is one of the case report. The patient reported with a fractured tooth of 11. He has four history of post and post treatment with 11 and 12. This is the front view and the occlusal view. This is my specific examination where you can see so now what can be my treatment plan? So I come with a solid shield technique with 11. I place my implant by horizon and then I document with the grafting procedure with 100% GPF placement. This is how I gave the incision. I reflected my flap. I curated my buckler shield. I remove my palate section. I place the implant. So now coming to the next technique is the protection technique. This procedure is used as a adjunct for the cantilever, or you can use it as a pontic sac. So the indication is mobile tooth root with a vertically fractured buccolic belly, very narrow and curved root, root close to adjacent tooth, and external resorption on the buccal. So this is same like sophistical technique but here instead of placing my implant i'm grafting the space with and i'm closing it so this can be used as a pontic set so i'm showing showing what case which is done by my mentor this is the initial view the patient has a fracture post this is what the shield has been prepared you can see here and then with the stand I put the uh, I place the implant in the socket shield, and this is my pontic shield. So in the case of pontic shield, I crafted it, and here there was a very less soft tissue, so I underwent with the connected tissue graft. So this is same day tempor temporization. This is post op, so you can see the difference between the socket shield. In placing, you can see this the shield, and in the pontic shield, you can see the shield along with the graft so this is how the architecture the double architecture and this is the final process so this is initial and this is the final smile so now coming to the next technique is the root submergence technique here the root is submerged inside and it closed and can be used as a context side so these are the indication and contraindication as a pontic side can be used for the teeth supported fixed partial denture can also be used in the implant supported fixed partial denture or can be under the removable denture to maintain the other rich dimension and can be used under the cantilever implant process so this is one case so root has been submerged here implant has been cleaned have success of it you can see this root has been submerged radiographically. And this is the final process. So, this is one of the wonderful book of partial extraction therapy once done by Dr. Karen and Dr. Prana. So, thank you for your patience here. Yes. Any questions? Any questions to Dr. Aishwarya Kadu?
just if you have any questions you can text in chat box will be asking be up of you even after the conference will be getting officially through email yes. the questions yes the questions you arise i think no questions ma'am thank you thank you very much madam for participating in this event on behalf of yes on behalf of organizer committee member of dental science as well as oral health congress 2021 we want thank you for your presentation thank you. thanks thank you thank you for sharing your tips with us looking forward to meet again next time now we welcome dr jay priya jay kumar from university of dundee center of forensic and legal medicine as well as dentistry from dundee from united kingdom to start the presentation um hi there am i audible yes madam it's perfect and is the video visible as well i'll try and start sharing the screen Um, can you guys see the screen as well? Yes, madam, it's fine. Okay. Okay, yes. I'll start the session then. Um, so, greetings one and all, and thank you Innovian Conferences for giving me this opportunity in the first place. Um, it's morning in the UK, and uh, I really hope everyone's having a good day. The title for today, the topic for today is a very simple topic and I really hope every uh, attendee um, enjoys the topic as well. But I think uh, although it's a very simple topic, uh, it's quite an important topic, uh, not just for dentists, but for anyone who does um, dental charting. So it could be dental hygienists, dental assistants, dental nurses, um, interns, Anyone who practically does dental charting, I think and this topic would be useful for them. Um, so the title of today's topic is Forensic Value of Dental Anomalies in Human Identification. Um, a little about me, I am Dr. Jeffrey Jekmar, as mentioned before. I did do my BDS in India, but I did my master's uh, in forensic dentistry uh, from UK, Scotland to be precise. So. I'm also a prospective PhD candidate, so I really like the research aspect of dentistry as well. Um, for work, I'm uh, practicing as a forensic ontologist in the UK, but I'm also a forensic consultant in the US as well. So um, I've just um, graduated two years ago, but I'm really into research as of now. So that's a little about me. Um, before we go into the presentation itself, uh, this is more like a, a rule to follow, like a request per se. So because forensics is such, an, such a sensitive topic and because we deal with human remains, um, I would really prefer all the attendees not to share any images or take any pictures of the cases disclosed due to uh, legal issues as well. Uh, so uh, one of the reason could be trigger responses because someone who sees um, a dead body's image would not probably um, have the same response as a professional would have and also, I know as dentists, we are always told to respect cadavers, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, patients, but we need to give the same respect to cadavers as well, because identified or not, they're end of the day, uh, a person that deserves respect as well. So I really hope no photos are taken and I'll thank you in advance for that. So, Today's topic, so today's content, so we're going to start with forensic ontology, what is forensic ontology, why we need forensic ontology, and the primary roles cases in the past as well. And then we're going to be talking about dental autopsy, summarize what we do in the mortuary. Um, the third part is the research aspect of the topic research that I conducted in 2019. So it's a role of dental anomalies when it comes to identifying someone. We're going to be talking about the methodology, the results, and something that I coined the scale of forensic significance of dental features. And last but not the least, we're going to be talking about something that I created, the Atlas of Dental Anomalies, and how to use it. So starting off with forensic odontology, what is forensic odontology? Now to 
Uh, it is that branch of dentistry in the interest of justice deal, deals with the proper handling and examination of dental evidence and with the proper evaluation and presentation of them. Now, why do we need forensic odontology? Uh, we can all agree to the fact that identifying an individual is basically determining his or her individuality. Now, very commonly used primary identifiers are basically DNA and fingerprints. But when it comes to DNA, uh, in cases of identical twins, the fingerprints hold an upper hand when it comes to identification. But even with fingerprints, in some cases, such as major fires or decaying and decomposing bodies, or in case of extensive trauma, you might not get fingerprints to actually analyze. This is where teeth comes into um, picture. So teeth is not something that only provides individuality, but it is also durable and is highly resistant to damage. And this is one of the reasons why identification is one of the easiest, reliable, and economical method of identification compared to maybe DNA or fingerprints because they are quite complicated and expensive and they're time consuming as well. Now, what can a forensic ontologist do? So, what are our primary functions or primary roles? So starting off with um, human identification, so that is like the major part. It's also going to be the major portion of our discussion today. Um, the next would be age estimation. Age estimation is a very complex, important, and interesting part of forensic ontology. So this is mainly done to assess the age of children, adolescents, and even adults. And this is done by various methods. It could be visual, it could be radiographic, it could be biochemical. And this is mainly done to understand if a victim or an accused is a minor or uh, in countries such as UK, you sort of analyze the age of a person of uh, someone who has a refugee status. And this is mainly for um, legal purposes as well. Uh, the next aspect is bite mark analysis. Now bite marks is a very interesting topic, but it's also a very sensitive topic when it comes to forensic ontology. A lot of forensic ontologists that I know uh, have also opted out of doing bite marks because of its sensitivity and because of the risk factor involved in the field, mainly because there have been wrong convictions um, in the past, especially in countries like US, where there are several reasons, which could be a totally other different um, lecture and a session for another day. But this has quite tarnished the name of forensic ontology when it comes to bite marks. But yes, bite marks is also a part of forensic odontology. Another aspect is DVI or disaster victim. Now, this is a very strenuous part of being a forensic odontologist because it depends on how bad the and how many victims you have to identify per day. So you could be located anywhere around the world and it could be a, a really physically st straining um, work because you could be there for days together. It could also take a toll on your mental health because you're surrounded by death and uh, decay for days together. And it could be you're away from your family. So it's, it's a strenuous part of forensic ontology, but again, a very crucial uh, aspect when it comes to forensic ontology. Another factor is, another aspect is fraudulence, which is mainly dental fraudulence. So this is more of a cultural or legal aspect. Why? Because you sort of identify fraud when it comes to dental treatments because um, especially in developing countries, you can see how some dentists might actually persuade the patient into taking up a treatment that was probably not quite necessary for the patient. And this is mainly done for personal benefits, which are financial benefits, to be honest. So this is basically identifying if a treatment was necessary for this patient or not. That is dental fraudulence. And as every scientific subject, there is also a research and teaching part of forensic ontology as well. But you can also work as an expert witness. That is, you can submit your findings as dental evidence to the court. And these cases can range from anything from rape, sexual assault. It could be child or domestic abuse or age estimation and identification even. Now, moving on to some famous cases in forensic ontology. So the first ever documented case of forensic ontology had happened 2,000 years ago. So there was a Roman emperor called Claudius and his wife, Agrippina, 
had ordered her soldiers to kill Claudius's first wife, who is Lolia Paulina. So she basically asked her soldiers to severe um, Lolia Paulina's head, and she identified the head as Lolia Paulina's by looking at her dental alignment and certain distinctive characteristics of her dentition. So this is the first recorded use of dental identification that we know of. Another interesting case is of Adolf Hitler. So we all know after the Second World War, Adolf Hitler and his wife had actually committed suicide. And yes, the Russian forces did discover their remains, but their autopsy lower jaw and partial skull fragments. It was years later that Hitler's dentist, Mr. Hugo Blaschke, I hope I'm spelling that right, uh, did identify these fragments as it is of Hitler's from his nine unit dental bridge. So this is also quite an important uh, milestone when it came to forensic ontology. Another quite popular case is of bite marks on Lisa Levy actually matched his impressions. And this was the first recorded in time in Florida's history that a case relied on. Now, this was also recorded in one of the docu-series on Netflix called Conversations with the Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes. And there is also Trade Center disaster, at least 501 victims were identified by dental comparison. And similarly, during the tsunami disaster in Australia, forensic odontology contributed to 87% of the identification. 9% of the victims had in mind identified by fingerprints and 0.5 by DNA evidence. And um, in the same case, uh, in Thailand as well, after seven months after the disaster, about 70% of the victims were identified by dental information as well. Now, moving on to dental autopsy. So this is going to be a small overview on what we actually do during an autopsy. So definitely, we start off with our initial and Preferably, a dental autopsy is done by two dentists, and you sort of assign between among yourselves who is the dirty dentist, that is the one who does the autopsy, and who's the clean dentist who does the chart? We have two type of forms, the anti-mortem form, which is called the AM form, which is the yellow form, and the post-mortem form, which is the PM form, which is the pink form. So during the autopsy, you're going to be having the pink form that you're going to use for the dental charting. Um, the next is oral prep. So this is basically gaining access to the teeth. So when you receive um, a body, you you sort of tend to struggle with opening their mouth because they're going to be quite rigid. So it wouldn't be as easy as how it is going to be in a patient, of course. So you sort of pry it open and sort of keep it stable so that you have that sort of visibility and accessibility while you do your dental autopsy. In some cases, such as burns or in cases of rigor mortis, there is less access. And this is when you sort of make an incision, which is as less invasive as possible. There are several studies that talk about several types of incision, but probably uh, the most easiest and probably the less invasive incision is making an incision from the angle of the mouth to the tragus of the ear on either side, doing the autopsy and stitching it back up. But what needs to be mentioned is this should be the last measure. Uh, most of the times you can get access by but this should be like the last measure into gaining access into oral cavity. After that, um, you definitely clean the oral cavity. Why? Because you never know from where you receive the body. So it could be from underground, from the river. So there could be dirt, or there could even be maggots or worms crawling out. 
the mouth or the face. So you sort of need to clean um, the oral area, the oral cavity. Now is the crucial part of the autopsy, the PM recording. So it starts off with PM charting and you go quadrant wise from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant. Most of the mortuaries or even certain forensic odontologists carry a portable X-ray machine, as you can see in the image. And even these are taken quadrant wise, so from the first to the fourth. And the most commonly taken X-rays are uh, periapicals and bite wings. And definitely you need to take photographs as well. When it comes to photographs, sometimes you have to identify just fragments or just a mandible. So you, as you can see in the image, there is something called as an ABFO scale. So ABFO means American Board of Forensic Anatology Scale. So you place the scale along with the fragment that you're working on. So it could be a mandible, it could be a skull fragment, it could even be a single tooth or a set of teeth. So this scale later on, once you photograph, will help you with the measurements when you're working on it. But if it's a whole body that you get for an autopsy itself, then you take photographs as similar to how you would take it in a live patient. Anti-mortem data collection is basically your AM data. So AM data could be anything from dental records, x-rays, photographs, charts, even dental appliances or study models or casts. But um, so basically AM data is anything that gives you information about someone's oral cavity. And this is not done by us. So this is basically, at least in the UK, it's done by uh, the police. Now, this, this is one of the reasons why the session is important for police training as well, because they would know what to collect as AM data. And this is one of the reasons why the atlas that I created was given to the Scottish police as well. Now, after you receive the AM data, you sort of start doing So you have the PM form that is already filled during the autopsy. And then anything that you get, because the charting, the the appliances, anything that you get is charted on the yellow form, and then you still do the comparison. Now, you always do PM first. Why? Because it's seen that when you see the AM data and then you do your autopsy, you tend to have that bias to sort of uh, match. So you subconsciously try and match the data. So sort of to, to use this bias, you do your PM first, and then you do your AM recording and then the comparison. So after the comparison, you come up with one of the four conclusions. So it could be positive identification. That is, so you're basically saying, oh, this is Mr. X. Uh, your possible identification is there are inexplainable uh, inconsistencies, but you think this may be Mr. X. Insufficient evidence is when you don't have enough AM data to come to a conclusion and exclusion is excluding out. So you're saying this is not Mr. X. So after your comparison is the report next most crucial part of your autopsy, because even after your autopsy, this report is going to stay on for years. This is probably um, the one document that is going to go to court or go to a lawyer or a policeman. So the first uh, two pages of your report needs the case details, your qualifications, the chronology of events, summary of the findings that you've um, actually got, and definitely the Next pages need to have the dental charting, so the AM and the PM dental charting. And there needs to be a glossary. Why you need a glossary is because, as I said, the report is not only going to be read by dentists. It could go to a policeman. It could go to uh, a lawyer, a judge. Um, but they wouldn't know what mesial surface is or what mesial occlusal surface is. So the glossary would help them sort of go through the report without needing a dentist to actually read the report. And of course, uh, you need to add your radiographs, the inference, the radiographs and photographs and its description as well. So this is a very small overview of what we do. The role of dental anomalies in identification. Now, uh, forensic odontology is based on the 
dentition. Now, this uniqueness comes from either from dental features like missing teeth, fillings, crowns, etc., or from dental anomalies such as rotation, missing, um, an additional cusp, uh, that sort of thing. Now, what I wanted to study was uh, so my sample size, my sample was definitely from India, from South India. So I wanted to evaluate the awareness uh, regarding the forensic value of recording these dental anomalies. Now, so what I did is I, I conducted an only online survey-based study on 101 dentists in South India with a clinical experience of zero to 10 years using Google Forms. So the survey basically had four sections. The first section basically had the participant's background, um, years of experience, which state they're practicing, et cetera. The second section was more of a Um, section three basically had questions on the attitude of using these digital tools. And then section four was based on dental record maintenance and a basic awareness of forensic ontology amongst these dentists. Now, coming to section two, because this is a dental survey test, the participants are sure to show that they made errors in opening gums and missed a few anomalies. And I gave them 24 options to choose from. So for every single tooth, they had to choose. Um, an option. And I also gave them like an additional space for them to pick findings such as spacing, uh, midline diastema, crowding, stains, calculus, etc. Now coming to the results, um, to be honest, uh, the results were quite um, unsatisfactory, but quite expected, to be honest. A lot of anomalies were overlooked and or incorrectly recorded. And very obvious anomalies such as midline diastema and crowding were overlooked and very, like a very minor uh, percent of people only actually addressed it. 17.8% of the participants misnamed the maxillary cusp and transposition on 1, 3 and 2, 3 were charted only by 5.9% of the participants. Now coming to section three and four uh, of the online survey was quite promising because uh, it was seen that majority of the participants did understand the importance of recording uh, these dental anomalies, but however, they didn't put it into practice. So they didn't do it in their dental charting task, but they accepted that, yes, they have some sort of forensic value. It was also good to see that they understood that dental features could be utilized for identification, and they understood why uh, dental records need to be maintained. So that was probably a satisfactory part of the results that I um, got from the survey. Now, from the study, we understood that although there is an increased awareness of forensic ontology, there is an increased awareness of forensic value of recording these dental anomalies. Also, I need to say that this is going to be like an educational tool that I had to do um, as part of my like doctoral study. Um, so this was um, from a dental body by a person in 2019. So the lower jaw was completely dental. And the upper jaw had four teeth, which you can see in the image. Now, this is a uh, photograph, an AM photograph from 1995. And what I want you to focus on is this 2-4, which is distally rotated. Now, what needs to be mentioned is in this particular case, it was this one tooth, along with, of course, x-rays, that was a key identifying feature for this person. So from this case, we can understand that even a single feature or a single anomaly can help in identifying someone if they're recorded properly in AM data. It could be your dental charts, it could be a radiograph, it could be a photograph as in this case. Now, to understand this further, I created something called the tool of So this basically gives you an idea of how you record how a dentist records every single anomaly can be used by a forensic dentist. Um, I really personally believe this is a matter of life. Now, the scale has three parameters, so it's inaccurate. Which is a case of like an x-ray. Okay. Uh, 
with the speed that the FCA has computed was mentioned only by 11.9% of the participants. And it was interesting to observe that 17.8% of the participants misnamed it as talents cusp. Now, for the ones who said it was an accessory cusp, this is perfect for me because this would be accurate and this will help me in identifying, positively identifying someone. For the ones who wrote talents cusp, it's partially correct because this is an inconsistency that I can explain. So these findings will still help me in identification, but I can explain why it could be a possible dental charting error from the dentist's side. But for the ones who wrote torodont, this finding is absolutely incorrect and this is no way going to help me uh, in identifying someone. To further look into its forensic significance, lead me to positive identification. A partially correct answer is a point of that limited forensic significance because as long as these minor errors are explainable consistencies, it's not going to throw me off of the path of positive answers are going to lead me into exclusion. For example, I might have Mr. X in my uh, autopsy table, but I would probably exclude him as, oh, this is not Mr. X because of the certain finding, which was done by a dentist, while it is Mr. X's family who is standing outside the mortuary waiting to know if it's their father, son, friend, or husband. So as I said, this is why I really think it's a matter of life, although it is something very minuscule that we tend to overlook. Um, and again, um, repeating myself, this is why recording every single dental feature and anomaly has its own forensic significance. Now, to tackle this issue, I created the Atlas of Dental Anatomy. So this is mainly for study uh, material for dental students, or it could be a checklist for dental students. Even a reference for dental students. Now, the Atlas is actually a digital atlas, which I'm going to be showing you. So it can be accessed using um, the website shown on this slide and also a QR code, which gives you um, the PDF version of the Atlas. But to show you the site, um, is the site visible to you guys? Yes, yes. Perfect. So this is the uh, digital Atlas. So when you go to the website, this is a small introduction, and this is the atlas itself. So you can go onto the anomaly itself, and it would open uh, a dialog box with a small description of the of the anomaly mentioned. You can also go through um, the names of the anomaly, and it would do the same thing. So it would open up a dialog box and um, give you the description as well. And I've also added positional anomalies such as midline diastema. Um, because there were um, also positional anomalies that were overlooked quite often. I've also given pulpal anomalies, which would uh, give a radiographic image and also describe the anomaly itself. Um, I'm going to scroll down. This is the team I worked with. And of course, there's a Let's Chat box where you can pop in your queries and it will be directed to me. Um, but if you want to want a printed version of the Atlas, you can always go to the PDF version and this is downloadable and printable as well. Now going back to um, the slide. So that is the Atlas. Now to conclude, um, although it was seen that identification by teeth was considered to be one of the easiest and reliable economic methods of identification, it is still not used up to especially in a country like India. Uh, the awareness on forensic ontology among dentists were exceptional, but charting of dental um, We also saw through the case that even a single feature anomaly can help in identifying someone, but only if it is recorded in the AM data. And this could be anything from dental charting, from uh, photographs, radiographs, costs, anything. Now, 
Last but not the least, the Atlas of Dental Anomalies and the Scale of Forensic Significance of Dental Features were created in the hope that it would create better, reliable, and up-to-date dental records that can be used for forensic purposes by forensic dentologists like us uh, in the future in India. Uh, to read a bit more about the topic, I've also published a paper. Um, so this is... Um, Thank you so much for listening uh, to this topic today and for any queries um, you can always uh, mail me in the email mentioned, mentioned in the slide and thank you I'm ready to take any questions if there are any yes any questions yes any questions to Dr. Jaya Priya Jaya Kumar Just if you have any questions, you can test in chat box. We'll be asking via phone. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, madam, for participating in this event. On behalf of yes, on behalf of our organizing committee member of dental science as well as for our Congress 2021, we want to thank you for your excellent presentation. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meeting an next time. Physical event if everything goes well in 2022. Thank you. Yes. Now we we invite Dr. Shantala Malikarjan from India to start the presentation. The topic will be minimal investment industry in secondary prevention level of case.
history and secondary prevention level or two different thing it's not completely two different thing or at the same time it is not same it overlaps with each other to have yeah i would begin my presentation thanking organizers dental science and oral health congress for giving an opportunity to present my view this webinar on minimally invasive dentistry in secondary prevention level of caries so minimally invasive dentistry and secondary prevention level are two different thing it's not completely two different thing or at the same time it is not same it overlaps with each other to have a clarity on what is that we are going to see let's let's deal with the definition of mid when you look at the definition of the mid the things that we must take into notice are what is it trying to say it is based on the philosophy of the professional dental care concerned with a first occurrence earliest detection and earliest possible cure of the disease on micromolecular levels followed by minimally invasive and patient friendly treatment to repair irreversible damage caused by such disease which i will explain in my further slides so coming to prevention level as all of us know prevention level there are primary secondary and tertiary so how was it primary different from secondary before going on to secondary level of prevention in primary prevention level of caries it's about early detection of the caries assessment for prevention and planning preventive strategy which again we'll see coming to the definition of secondary prevention level of caries i would like to have all of your focus or attention to this it says it it says directed towards a disease that has already started or developed and involves action that halts the progress of a disease at its initial stage and prevents complication it means whereas in mid it started from earliest detection and uh, management micro micromolecularly and minimally invasive here it starts with disease that has already developed what do we mean by disease that is already developed in dental caries the first occurrence as it says in mid and earliest detection of the caries as is in mid and in secondary levels of prevention it is already occurred or established or known as white spot lesion as you can see the image in the incisor edge of the incisors you can see a white opacities which is marked with a marker that is known as white spot lesion these white spot lesions are precursors to frank enamel caries and relatively enamel remain unaltered and whitish hence known as white spot now i recall our definition of uh, secondary prevention of caries where it says if untreated to to prevent uh, complications or cavitation if white spot lesion if not intervened or if not treated goes on to caries progression and cavitation in this presentation i am trying to bridge these two definitions of mid and secondary prevention caries and propose a treatment plan if you focus on this definition of this part of mid that is early possible uh, cure of disease on micromolecular levels followed by minimally invasive and patient ac acceptance and and this sentence is sort of similar to the definition of the secondary prevention level which says so to if we clap to this the probable treatment technique or technology that could be will be micro invasive phase or also known as icon i icon is an emetitive it is used but it is also known as infiltration concept based on infiltration concept 
So we, how did this microinvasive evolve? Microinvasive evolved with invention of treating white spot lesions. Earlier stage, the white spot lesions, the only option was for to have it remineralized by replenishing with the remineralizing agents. As we have seen in the earlier slide, remineralizing process much before the occurrence of the lesion in anticipation treating non-invasive is known as primary level of prevention, which is non-invasive technique and non-invasive technique. And the only option then in the past was of using remineralizing agent or wait if it is if it the cavity is re remineralized no treat most of the time if it, if, if it results in cavitation to go in for restorative phase with an advent of uh, infiltration concept uh, the availability of the icon has this microinvasive phase evolved. Microinvasive phase is also known as it's in a technology known as microinvasive technology that arrests progression of lesions that are too advanced for fluoride therapy, enables immediate treatment of lesions, not advanced for restoration, and most importantly, no drilling or anesthesia required, hence acceptable to the patients. Now, with this, I have sort of combined both the definitions and try to give you an what could be the treatment plan that is on microinvasive technology and here is where I, I would like to explain what is uh, the concept or the material used is infiltration concept or also known as icon where a low viscosity resin material are used to, to fill the pore system of non cavitated white spot lesion. We are demonstrating oh, icon application on white spot lesion on the proximal surface of the molar. Starting needs to be rubber dam isolation. Placed in plumbing with the icon H. Icon H is here used as hydrofluoric acid, which is used for two minutes. And the Proximal strip of the icon, it has got a micropore system where uh, the material will flow only through the micropore system and to the adjacent enamel surface. After etching and rinsing of 30 seconds and drying, to use uh, apply icon dry for 10 seconds. followed by application of icon infiltrant for three minutes, three minutes and we'll have to take care when applying the icon infiltrant the number of turns to prevent overflow of the material and two and a half turn of this icon infiltration should be sufficient for it to cover the white spot lesion that is required. Followed by light cure of the material for 40 seconds. Yeah, in this concept, what happens is infiltrant soaks up, flows only into the micro pores of the white spot lesion. Sperm in soak the pores and it will block the pores and prevent diffusion of any kerogenic acid and thereby it stops in the progression of the caries and prevents lesion progression. And icon is usually applied only for enamel caries or in a very initial stages of the dentinal caries which is said as D1 and never to be used on beyond DEJ. So to, yes, I mean to understand the claimed progression of 
penetration and penetration of uh, icon into the porous uh, parasites of the white spot lesion in our department we conducted an in vitro study first we conducted on to uh, to evaluate the depth of penetration of icon and we observed that penetration of infiltrant were significant depth in white spot lesion and this has been published in a journal of clinical and diagnostic research in 2017. Later on, we wanted to know how it RST carries progression, which we studied using confocal microscope, and we observed a good uh, percentage of RST of carries progression. And again, this uh, data we have submitted for publication. And further we moved on, we wanted to extrapolate the findings of in vitro study in in vivo, but we chose to do it in a white spot lesion of post orthodontically treated teeth. Aim of this study was to see the resin penetration into white spot lesion of post orthodontically debonded teeth. And we observed about in 48.8% of the samples complete penetration of the resin was seen and whereas in 51.2 percent of the sample the penetration of the resin was between 93 to 99 percent which we can say almost 100 percent and with, the, with these studies in our department it uh, has shown it has shown that infiltration uh, concept can uh, block the deficiency of acetogenic fluids and arrest the caries progress. So with this, I would say when we to focus more on secondary prevention level of caries with MID concept using microinvasive technology you, with infiltration concept using an icon in lesion early enamel lesion white spot lesion has it has shown an a promising technique in preventing progression of white spot lesion and arresting caries that would answer for secondary level of prevention of the caries and prevent complication of the caries to progress on from white spot lesion so with this i would conclude my presentation thank you for your uh, attention and I would fail if would not uh, thank, uh, acknowledge our contributors, uh, faculty and postgraduate from our department, Dr. Elaine Barreto, Dr. George Babu, Dr. Anisha Sebastian, and special thanks to Dr. Soundirya G, postgraduate. Thank you, everyone. Yes, this is the video presentation from Dr. Shant Shantana Malikarjuna. Just if you have any questions, you can text in the chat box, we will be asking after the conference. Next, we, we ask Dr. Rohana Malona from Ilima, from Federal University of from Brazil. The title of the conference will be. Right? Cranial official reconstruction caused by physical assault within milia weapon, a scientific approach and case report. Yes, Dr. Lohan Lima, just you can start your presentation. Okay, it's no. Hi. Yes, madam, you can continue. Yes, you can continue. Hi. Yes, ma'am. We would like to inform Dr. Dr. Camilla. Yes, the from Federal University of Federal University from Brazil. We will be going to start the presentation. Yes. One second, please. Yes, you can you can take your own time. Um, you, have a lot of time. you can 
available the share screen, please? No. Yes, look, you can do it now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's fine. And do you hear me? Yes, it's perfect. Well, yes, it's perfect. Okay. And and uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this event. My name is Camila Siqueira de Aguiar, and I come to to present today a case report entitled Surgical Excision of Polymorphous Adenocarcinoma in the Maxilla with Mucous Flap Reconstruction. There are the co who helped in the organizations and pre preparations of the work and were part of the realizations of the clinical case. The case comes from the ambulatory of the maxillofacial surgery and traumatology, which has a coordination and surgery, uh, the professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela Aires de Mello. Talking a little more about me, I'm a dental surgery uh, at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil and master's student in odontology in the same university. I also do postgraduate in, in a computer and patients with special needs. Currently, I am intern at the ambulatory of the Federal University of Pernambuco. Let's start uh, with a brief introduction. Just a minute. And let's start with a brief introduction about the polymorphic adenocarcinoma. The polymorphous adenocarcinoma is a malignant epithelial tumor characterized by cytological uh, uh, unif uniformity and morphological uh, diversity, infiltrative growth, and uh, low metastatic potential. These conditions has been reported as a second most frequently malignant salivary gland neoplasmy uh, behind all of the mucoepidermoid carcinoma, the polymorphous Adenocarcinoma comes for approximately 7.3 to 26.4% of the all malignant uh, neoplasmies of the minor salivary glands and is most frequently among female between the 60 uh, and the 80 decades of life. Clinically, uh, the lesions were maybe be present in the oral cavity as follow hard to palpations, enlargement of the regions, asymptomatic nodule, and slow growth, ulceration of the mucose, and is locally uh, aggressive and infiltrative and occasionally bleeding and discomforts are reported. The most frequent affected sites are in minor salivary glands and on the hard palate, soft palate, and specialty and 
upper lip and jugal mucosas. The clinically and histological differential uh, diagnostics of these conditions is between the pelmophic adenoma and aden adenoid cyst uh, carcinoma. Diagnostic is clinical based in, on imaging and histopathological examinations. In a microscope analysis, the polymorphous adenocarcinoma shows infiltrative cells, blooms, uh, absence of the capsule with general uh, lobular morphology and diverse histological patterns being tools uh, defined as with a pseudoniform and shape the tumor cells have spherical or polygonal uh, shape and the nuclei can be spherical and fusiform ovoid with a cytoplasm of varied stating. In addiction, and the cells may have different growth uh, patterns and normally the solid crib form and tubular, trabecular, fascicular, and papillary form, which justify the name and uh, polymorphicals. Uh, the perihypal cells generate have one infiltrate appearance, and by inviting the underlying tissues in the form of rows. The treatment of choice for polymorphous adenocarcinoma described in the medical literature is extensively surgical excisions with margins, commonly included the excisions of the underlying a possibility of combinations with radiotherapy. And I request that uh, you know, no take photos of pictures in the this patient's image images, and the patients it's uh, as 23, uh, 60 years old, 63 years old, white male patients, and so the maxillofacial surgery and traumatology services at the Federal University of Pernambuco, clinically, uh, in his complaint of a tumor like a lesion in his left maxilla. And during, during the anamnesis, and the patient reported a history of a surgery and 10 years before for removal a tooth in upper left eye. His complaint the, that the painless tumor-like lesions development in his left maxilla, which are gradually progress over time. At the extra oral examinations, the patient presented a slightly increase in volume the intraoral clinical examinations show the presence of upper and down total dentures at increased in uh, volume in the left maxillary tuberosity region and a lesion of nodular furrows with a uh, fibrous and smooth cons consistency fixed and uh, sessile with oval shape, defined age and painless symptomatology. And, and radiographically imagined by panoramic radiograph revealed a lesion with a mixed uh, radiographic density projected in the left maxillary tuberosity region 
the information provided by conventional uh, conventional uh, radiographic examines is limited to required uh, complement examinations to enable a better uh, better diagnostics and surgical planning. And in a view uh, of the computer tomography scans, we are obtaining uh, and using for 3D images reconstructions. An um, axial tomography view indicate the presence of uh, aterogenes lesions with osteolysis alterations in the cortical and trabecular bones and reabsorptions of the left palatine bones with a regular contours and definite age. The following radiographic topography was evidences on one lesions projected into the alveolar process and lo located uh, from the premolar regions stand towards the left maxillary zygomatic structure. The patient was submitted to a surgical procedure under general anesthesia. Initially, an excision uh, was made from the upper labial frenal region and to the left maxillary tuberos tuberosity region, followed uh, by a mucoperiostical flap detachment and resections uh, of the tumor with encompassment the buccal vestibule and tub tuberosity tonsillar pillar and the left retromolar region the the markers The demarcation of segmental osteotomy of the upper left canine infraorbital regions and maxillary tuberosity was performed uh, all the way to the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, followed by osteotomy and left emaxillectomy with safety measures. Surgery continues with uh, clamping and cauterizations of bleed vessels and curettage of uh, maxillary sinus. During the, uh, the surgery, a drain uh, was placed through a nasal contour, contour open in the left maxillary sinus using a uh, 14 nelaton probe. Lastly, the surgery procedure and with a mucus flap reconstructions and interrupted sutures with a mononylon uh, 5.0 treat. The surgical specimen uh, was sent to the oral histopathological laboratory of the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil, where the free margins uh, were confirmed. The mi microscopic uh, examinations, the lesions present areas of peripheral infiltrations and the presence of tumor cells uh, in the subepithelial region, neoplastic cells with a uh, oval nuclear arranged in ductos uh, with intraductal papillar profilations. Neoplastic oncocytic cells, tumor cells with a uh, oval nuclei arranged in ductus with a uh, eyeline stroma as well as tumor infiltrations of adjacent tissues. 
the patient was followed for up, up for a period to, of two years and present completed tissues adaptations in uh, operated region with good ha uh, handling and favorable uh, aesthetics with no evidence of recohesions. And subsequently, um, he, he have a prosthetic rehabilitation. We uh, verified for a, a successful of the treatment of these patients in our questions was uh, necessary to have a good analysis and recurrency, uh, one correct request for the complementary exams so that the diagnostics of these patients was accurated uh, and the choice of surgical treatment uh, would restore the patient's functions and aesthetics with a uh, maintenance of his survival. There are the references used in this case. If you want to um, see this article, it is disponible in the internet. This is my team in Brazil, and I have to in here to email of my advisors and the mine email for any questions and uh, Instagram account of my service. If my Instagram, if you need and, and have any questions, send me an email on a direct. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Any questions to Dr. Kimela Securo? Any questions? I think no questions, madam. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for participating in this event. On behalf of our Health Committee member of Dental Science as well as Oral Health Congress 2021, we want to thank you for instant presentation. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meet again next time. Yeah. Now we ask Dr. Lucas Vihana from Federal University of Pernambuco from Brazil to start the presentation. Okay. I'm audible and visible. Yes, it, yes, it's perfect, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Lucas Viana Angelim. I'm a dental student and intern at Maxillo Facial Surgery Service at the Federal University of Pernambuco. And I come to bring a case report entitled The Actuation of Maxillofacial. Sorry. Actuation of Maxillofacial Surgeon in Treatment of Pathology in Inferior Eye Lead. I have as my supervisor and responsible for, for the study, Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela Arigimel. First of all, I would like to thank. Thank you for the opportunity to present this case report at the Dental Science and Oral Health Congress. Starting my presentation, starting my, my introduction, the word graft ha can have two main meanings, one related to the field of botany and another which will, be, which will be the purpose of this presentation related to health area. As we can see, uh, according to this meaning, a graft is a surgical operation that consists of transplanting organs or tissues taken from the patient or from another individual to somebody. We should remove the tissue from a donor site to a recipient site to reestablish the aesthetics and the function of the place. 
Several factors can make the professionals use grafts, such as traumas, burns, or injuries. The grafts can be defined, divided, and classified according to the location of the donor site and the recipient site. When they are in the same patient, we can call it autogenous graft. When the donor site is in one, one individual and the recipient site is in another individual, but with an extremely similar genetic load, like in case of twin brothers, for example, we can call it isologous graft. The allogenic graft is when the, the transplantation the, is, to, is from one individual to another at the same species, like two humans, two human beings. The term xenograft is used when the tissue is taken from an individual to another of, the, of another species, such as oxen and pigs, for example. And finally, the alloplastic grafts are those that have mineral or synthetic origin. When we talk about skin grafts, we can divide it in two groups. The partial ones are, uh, are those which only epidermis and part of dermis will be used. By the other hand, the total grafts uh, we, will, we will use epidermis, dermis, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, in addiction to vascular and nervous plexus. To ensure good graft effectiveness, the donor tissue must be completely desvascularized. It happened because healing is truly related to revascularization. This revascularization will pass through three phases. In the first one, we, will, we can see the serum absorption in the first 42, 48 hours. In the second phase, we can see the alignment of blood vessels. And finally, the capillaries meet, resulting in a revascularization. We can use some parameters to guarantee the effectiveness and survival of the graft, which are the low risk of infection, the high ease of acquisition, the low production of antigens, and the high level of safety. However, the tissue of the donor site and the recipient site must, must have similar characteristics. So the aesthetics of the site are also reestablished. So we must pay attention to five main factors that will interfere in this situation. We, we need to pay attention to the color of the tissue, the thickness, the morbidity, the vascularity, and the texture of the both sides. So the purpose of this presentation is to show and highlight the peculiarities of the skills developed in maxillofacial surgery through a, a complex case re report whose patient received a surgical therapy in a pathological process after being neglected by the medical team in her city. The 80 years old patient came to our service with a lesion in left lower eyelid. This lesion was 10 years of evolution and a size of three per one and a half centimeters. It was pedunculated, hard, hard to touch and painless. And because of the big size, it's already interfering in the vision and mobility of the eyelid of the patient. But you could ask me, why did the lesion grow up for so long? And, or why wasn't the treatment done earlier? The patient lived in, in a city called Venturosa is about 20, 250 miles from the main city of the state, Recife. And for this reason, she depended on the medical service of her city, which uh, for which she was neglected. 
this neglect will not only cause a physical damage to the evolution uh, of the disease, but also a social a social damage since the patient don't didn't like to go out her house or receive the family for a visit and psychological damage too because she was neglected by the team that should be responsible to take care of her so the maxillofacial surgery team at the federal university of pernambuco done the surgery the surgery was done under local anesthesia and an excisional biopsy was made in which we removed the entire lesion in a single surgical procedure for a better prognosis uh, postoperative the surgery was executed respecting the safety margins to avoid any possibility of recurrence and the lesion was apprehended with a wire to facilitate the handling. Several areas of our, our body can be used as a donor site to the face region, such as a pectoral region, a supraclavicular, a supraclavicular fossa, and the internal portion of arm. But those regions uh, can be very compatible to the face, but our team look to the five characteristics previously mentioned, color, thickness, vascularity, morbidity, and texture. And the patient, all of those parts was affected by the, the exposure to sunlight. So the team observed the posterior region of the auricular pavilion was highly compatible with the patients I lead. A sterile paper was placed over the donor place to determine the size of the area that would be transplanted. The suture was performed at separate stitches with six mononylon sized wire. In the images, we can observe the post-operative uh, from both donor and recipient sites. After six months, it was already possible to observe an excellent aesthetics and functional result of the patient without any sign of recurrence. We sent the lesion to histopathological analysis and we observed island of basophilic cells similar to cells in the basal layer of epidermis that had infiltrative growth pattern into the dermis. When, you, when we observe the full histological slide, the edges and the base did not show any sign of pathology, showing us the true, the true importance of respecting the safety margins. The diagnosis was basal cell, basal cell carcinoma, carcinoma the most common neoplasm in skins of Caucasian individuals and highly associated with exposure to sunlight appearing between 10 to 50 years after those ex this exposure. Finally, this study highlights the importance of scientific knowledge, be it anatomical, pathological, or surgical, for the diagnosis and treatment that injuries that affect patients. However, the truly important, the true important is not based only in these three points, since humanitarian training and humanitarian vision associated with the scientific knowledge can uh, establish the patient in all aspects, functional, aesthetics, and social. Returning humanity and life for the, for those for those parents uh, patients and before I finish my presentation I would like uh, some time for a reflection in the image we can see a garbage bag in shape of a liver and the phrase stop wasting life since during my all my presentation I talk about transplants so think about it be donor you can also have the power to save someone's life. 
I'm truly grateful for the opportunity and thank you very much. Yes. Any questions? Any questions to Dr. Lucas Miana? Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for participating in this event. On behalf of our organizing committee, member of Dental Science as well as Foreign Health Congress 2021, we want to thank you for your insight presentation. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meeting again next time. Yes. Now we will have 10 minutes break and join the event sharp around 4.35 around to according to IST timings. Just we have will have 10 minutes break and we will rejoin the shop by 4.35 according to IST timings. Then after Dr. Lohana Dilimo from Federal University of Perenbach from Brazil will be joining the presentation.
yes yes we are going to start the program again so let us invite dr rohol lohana marilyn aquiana from federal university of perenbok from brazil to start presentation of the talk hello good day yes ma'am <laughs> yeah thank you uh, just a minute please yes we get one time we have a lot of time So you could see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's okay. Uh, can I start? Yes. Um, so, hello. Uh, just a minute. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am, it's fine. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Lohana Lima, and I'm from Brazil. And today, my topic is the cranial facial reconstruction caused by physical assault with milieu a scientific approach, and a case report. This is the adulterers of this case. And I'm from the Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service. And this case was guided by the head of the service, the professor, Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela de Mello. So I will start uh, talking about a little bit by my biography. I'm a dental surgery and master studied in integrated clinics at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. I'm an intern at Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service at the Federal University of Pernambuco, being a member of the Project Care for Patients with Oral Disease and Facial Traumas, the project intitulated Prevention and Treatment of Cancer in Face and Mouth Regions in Venturosa, Pernambuco, Brazil, and the project intitulated Use of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Treatment of Patients with Temporal Mandibular Disorders. In 2019, I was in validation by Peruvian Arms to give a conference at the 13th National Congress of Military Police Dentistry at Gesto del Peru. In 2020, I was in validation in an international keynote speak in the USA, France, and England. And now I'm researching on nerve regeneration and metabolic disorders in the patients with bone pathologies in face. So uh, first, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy. It's important to talk about the anatomy. And the human head has 22 bones, being eight from the cranial and 14 are from the face. These bones are responsible for protecting important extra tourists. And it's important to know that for know how to intervene in facial traumas. The facial skeleton is considered an idea structure to resist to mastigatory and trauma forces, which structure is considered basically by horizontal and vertical pillars. The school pillars are hinged structures which are strategically distributed around the different cranial facial cavities, like the orbital, nasal, and oral cavities, and the paranasal sinus. It's important to know about these pillars because the fracture lines occur exactly between these pillars, and that's why the facial traumas reconstruction have to be done respect them. Uh, the facial trauma is the most device aggression found in the trauma centers in Brazil. And we will talk a little bit about the etiology and the, epi and the epidemiology. So 
the etiology of the facial traumas is varied and according to customs of age culture. In a retrospective study conducted at the Refir Hospital in Recife, Pernambuco, Brazil, by the professor Ricardo Eugenio Varela Elis de Mello, analyzed uh, 8,759 patients over a period of four years in which 4,548 patients had facial traumas. So in this graphic, we can see that we have the high percent of the traffic accidents followed by falls. And in the third position, we have the physical assault. The 23% of the patients affected by the physical assault corresponding to 1,048 patients. So between the okay. So the between the types of the physical assault, we have the largest case into between follows for assault by firearms, and then we have the melee weapon in the third position. In the Brazilian population, okay, in the Brazilian population, we have the largest cases to prevalence to mild patients in the proportion to three to one and at the third decade of life. Every patient who suffers a trauma should be treated according to the ATLS protocol and for it, have a priority sequence during care for the patients. The mnemonic X, A, B, C, D, E, which means X, uh, exsanguination hemorrhage with the control of several external bleeding, and the A, airway management and cervical spin stabilization, the B, briefing with the control of ventilation and oxygenation of the body, C, circulation with control of the perfusion and other hemorrhage. D, disability with the control of neurologic deficit due, uh, using the Glasgow Coma Scale, include assessment and the pupillary re reactions, and the E, exposure of the body. So the patient uh, must to have be treated, will follow the ATLS protocol, then cleaning and the cauterization of the bleeding vessels. After that, we will do the reconstruction of the fractures and then the tissue reconstruction by plans. So now we will talk about the case report. A uh, male patient, 20 years old, he arrived at the maxillofacial surgery and traumatology service at the Hefford's hospital in Recife, Pernambuco, Brazil, taken by the emergency medical service reporting that he had been a victim of physical assault by Amelia Whipple. In the anamnesis, it was observed that the patient was unconscious, drunk, help naked, with normal skin color, and with uh, fractures in craniofacial regions. Um, the ATLS protocol was followed with airway control by tracheal intubation and control of the bleeding vessels. The patient was taken for image examination and the image analysis of the computer tomography showed that the patients have fractures in the left regions of zygomatic process of the, front, the frontal bone the body of the left zygomatic, the bilateral maxillary, nasal, vomer, left temporal, hetmoid, and the left pariental, and the hysphenoid. In our front view, like we can see in this picture, we can see that the facial deformity. In a side view, we can see the extension of the injury and, uh, and as well the tissue uh, injury in the zygomatic, nasal, frontal, and occipitation regions. In this computer tomography of facial in an actual section view, showing for us a fracture of the maxillar and left zygomatic regions. 
um, inches out of view of the computer tomography of face in an actual section show a complex fracture of the facial bones. We can see a left temporal, left and right gen, nasal, vomit, hetmoid, and hysphenoid fractures. In a sagittal section, we can see the bonus fragments inside the orbital cavity, causing the loss of the left eyeball of the patients. So with the clinical characterizations and the imaging characterizations, the treatment plans was based on volume replacement before made with the hingers with lactator. And the patient was taken to the opera theater with the, was operated by neurosurgery team at the first. And after that, the whole team of maxillofacial surgery who performed the facial reconstruction. Trigger the lesion, and most of the bleeding vessels was performed, followed by the desbridement of the desvitalization tissues with the removal of speckle bones, bone speckles. Um, after this, uh, the fractures reductions were with steel whites fixings was made in, and we can see in this picture the reduction with the steel whites. Next, to promote a better consolidation, a rigid internal uh, stabilization with plates and screw was used to resort the facial contours of the orbital zygomatic region close to normal as possible, despite the loss of substance. And uh, as we can see in this picture, the shape of the orbital cavity has been restored. So after that, the ophthalmology team was called because had bone fragments inside the orbital cavity caused the destruction of the vitreous human that after analyzing caused the loss of vision and also was made the evisceration of the left eyeball. The surgery continues with the, reposi the reposition of the tissue by muscular plants and surgery was performed with separate points to which we can see and like we can see, have the satisfactory cohabitation of the edges. In this front view, an anterior nasal packing was placed to establish blurry vessels. In an immediate postoperative view, we can already see the image that the facial contour has been established. In the uh, postoperative view with one year follow up, um, an anterior view in the first picture, in an anterior low view in the second picture, we can see a satisfactory bone consolidation and the preserved contour with good facial symmetry. To carry out a completely realization of the case, the patient was referred to making an ocular prosthesis, getting him back to normal social life and in giving him back your self-esteem. So the conclusion, we have the successful uh, treatment depends on correctly healing of injuries as fast as possible of the trauma. In this case, it's seated. Uh, has a satisfactory bone consolidation, restoring the patient's function and aesthetic, include rehabilitation with ocular prosthesis and no postoperative complications occurring. So, when we have a multidisciplinary approach associated with a correct surgery technique, we will take a patient to a good prognosis. This is my, that is my reference, and this is my team in Brazil. In this middle of this photo, we have the professor, Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela de Gimelo. So below, I leave my contacts with my email and the email of the professor Ricardo. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a wonderful day and it's really a big pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, any questions? Any questions to Dr. Lohana Dilima?
just if you have any questions you can text in chat box will be asking be off of you even after yeah. the yes even after the completion of the conference okay thank you yes thank you thank you very much madam for speaking up in this conference on behalf of organizing committee member of dental science as well as oral health congress 2021 we want thank you for your insight presentation thanks for sharing your tips with us looking forward to meet again next time now we ask dr Lizan Kevlin Pereira de Silva from University Central FSU all from Brazil to start the presentation. Can you see me? Yes, madam. Can you see my print, my screen? Yes. Just you can enlarge it. Okay. So, hello. My name is Kate Yanni, and today I'm going to present a clinical case report entitled Excisions of Four Unerupted Canines in the Mentonian Region of the Mandible, Cases Tip. This are my co-authors and I'm representing the ambulatory of maxillofacial surgery and traumatology from the University Center Facol, coordinated by the Professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela Aiz Melo and Marcela Cortijal Fernandes. Um, I'm sorry, please Yanni. Yes, can you hear me? Uh Yes. Uh, do you want to? I can screen the share for you because it's not in the full screen. Um, yes, Lohana, please. Okay. Thank you. You can see. It's not on the first screen yet. Yes. Thank you, Hannah. Yes. Score. Hello, everyone. My name is Clay Siani, and today I'm going to present a clinical report entitled Excisions of Four Uninterrupted Canines in the Mentonian Region of the Mandible, Kisses Tip. Next. These are my co authors and I'm representing the Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology from the University Center Facol, coordinated by the Professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela Aiz Melo and Marcela Cortijal Fernandes. Next. I'm an undergraduate dentistry student of University Center Facol, and I'm an intern at the Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service 
at the Universal Center of Hakon, being a member of the project Care for Patients with Oral Diseases and Facial Traumas, the project Prevention and Treatment of Cancer in Face and Mouth Regions in Venturosa, Brazil, and the project entitled Use of Traditional traditional Chinese medicine and the treatment of patients with temporomandibular disorders. Next. So, an erupted tooth, also called impacted tooth by some authors, is a dental organ that even when fully developed, did not erupt at a regular time, being on the side of the bone and totally surrounded by bone tissue or by bone and mucous tissue. This is an example of an impacted lower third molar, where we can see the dental element surrounded by bone tissue, and this tooth had roots at 90, 90 degrees, which difficult the exodontic surgery. Next. The most frequent eruptions occur on usually layer erupted teeth. As the permanent teeth emerge, the jaw's development allows their alignment in the arch. When this development is not enough, teeth become excessively close together on an inadequate position or therefore remain unerupted, and the lack of space is the main cause of an eruption. This is another example of an impacted lower third molar, and we also can see the tooth surrounded by bone tissue. Next. According to Winter's classification, the frequency of impacted teeth appears in the following order, lower third molars, upper third molars, upper canines, lower canines, and in addition, upper premolars, lower premolars, incisors, and first and second molars. Next. Maxillary and mandibular canines, when present in their normal position, are important both from the aesthetic and functional perspectives. However, included permanent canines occur in a relatively common way, except for the third molars that occur in one to three percent of the population. The permanent maxillary canine is the most prevalent impacted tooth. Next. Here we have a panoramic X-ray where through the two-dimensional image, we can see impacted teeth, including canines, premolars, and third molars. And in addition, this patient has cladocranial dysplasia causing a delay in teeth eruption. Next. Talking about epidemiology, impaction of canines is 10 times more common in the maxilla than in mandible, mostly presenting unilateral tendency. Besides, it is three times more common in females, and its incidence in the population ranges from 1 to 2%, being more frequent in palatine than vestibular, and retentions in the mandible are more common through vestibular. Next. Some authors speculate about the causes of mandibular canine impaction and transmigration, such as traumatic factors, lack of space, long eruption pathway of the canine tooth germ, where the long and complex eruption pathway of the superior canine takes twice as long to complete its eruption when compared to other dental elements, premature loss of the dentition, crown, crown abnormal length, hereditary factors, functional disorders of endocrine glands, tumors and odontomas, and in such cases, surgical removal is indicated due to the possible association with pathological lesions, infection, injury to the neighboring teeth, and pain. Next. In this image, there is another impacted canine pointed by the arrow, and a better prognosis of impacted teeth may be attained when such condition is early diagnosed. It also requires a well-proceeded anamnesis, watching the signs and the symptoms that the tooth can provoke. Next. 
the main clinical findings to, that, to diagnose the presence of impacted canines are delayed eruption after 14 years old, prolonged retention of a primary canine, elevation of the palate or labial mucosa, and crowd distal immigrations from ladder incisors with or without midline deviation. Next. And it is important to know that the preservation of these impacted elements could create complications such as reduction of mandible bone tissue, increased prevalence of mandibular fractures, resorption of adjacent to fruits, local pain, and pathological changes. Next. The term kissing mandibular canines refers to a very original position of impacted lower canines where the vestibular surfaces are in contact in a single follicular space where roots point towards opposite directions in the midline, characterizing an extremely rare condition. Next. Many uninterrupted teeth present a well-developed pericoronal follicle which is radiographically visualized as a radiolucent area around the dental crown. However, these follicles can originate dentidral cysts, which are the most common type of odontogenic developmental cyst and are characterized by a lesion that originates from the separation of the follicles surrounding the crown of an impacted tooth. And dentidral cysts are more frequently associated with lower third molars, followed by upper canines and upper third molars, respectively. In this image, there is a dentidral cyst associated with the third molar, and it is already causing a bone tissue resorption and root resorption of the adjacent tooth. Next. The correct diagnosis of impacted teeth is determined through the choice and success of the proposed treatment and the location where the canine remains uninterrupted. And the causes of such impaction determine the treatment choice as well as its success. The treatment options adopted for uninterrupted teeth are basically divided into three groups non surgical conservative treatments aiming at the maintenance of the dental element without any surgical approach. The non-conservative ones, which consist in their elimination by exodontic surgical techniques and surgical conservative ones, and however, its exposition to surgical trauma is necessary. Next. This article aims to report a clinical case of a diagnosed uninterrupted lower canines associated with two other supernumerary teeth that radiographically have similar characteristics to canines surrounded by a dentidral cyst. A 14 year old female melanodermic patient attended at the oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service of the Federal University of Pernambuco, reporting Mentonian discomfort. Throughout the anamnese, the patient reported absence of lateral lower canines, as well as absence of traumatic factors to this region, and absence of the cedal element premature loss. No actual findings were detected at the extraoral clinical examination. And at the intraoral clinical examination, the patient presented with a discrete volume increase in the mandibular synthesis region with no alterations in the surrounding mucous membranes, absence of lateral lower canines, and absence of pain sensitivity. Therefore, the clinical case was radiograph finding. Next. An imaging-based screening was requested and reviewed a radiopaque image in the synthesis region of the mandible compatible with 
an erupted teeth associated with a radiolucent image suggesting adentidrous cyst. As well, we can see the kissed teeth position where the vestibular surfaces are in contact in a single follicular space, where roots point towards opposite direction in the midline. Due to the extinction of the lesion, the toes treatment was surgery under general anesthesia in order to, remo to remove the lesion and exodontic surgery of the third molars by orthodontic indication. Next. Firstly, incisions were performed in both right and left paracentosal regions of the mandible with displacements of mucopereal flaps followed by osteotomy and ostectomy to approach the lesion. Next. Then, aided by sounding elevators, the uppermost elements on the right side were removed by means of lever points and afterwards the left side was carefully managed in order to not injure the adjacent element roots. Also, it could generate space for lower left and right sides removal located in the basilar region of the mantle. Next. The lesion involving the unerupted teeth was carefully removed through curettage, so as not to damage the lower alveolar nerve vascular bundle. And this image, this lesion was sent to perform the histopathological screening at the oral histopathology laboratory of the Federal University of Pernambuco. And the surgical sequence continued with cavity cleaning and bone regularization, repositioning the flaps and sutures with separate points through 5.0 mono nylon wire. Next. The histopathological report performed by the Oral Histopathology Laboratory of the Federal University of Pernambuco identified an integral cyst and microscopically a pathological cavity covered by stratified squamous epithelium was observed, pointed by the first arrow. And the second arrow is pointing the adjacent fibrous connective tissue capsule without inflammation. Next. Over the post-operative period, the patient involved without philodistic signs and after one year, another facial radiography was requested for post-surgical control. Radiographically, the bone tissue healing in the region was observed, preserving the root sepsis of the inferior elements and clinically, the patient presented with preserved tissues and all dental elements demonstrated with vitality. Next. So here, here is the comparison of the before with the first radiography and the after one year. And the radiographic aspect presented in our case report differs from the most common aspect mentioned in the literature. Since the lesion comprised four dental elements involved by a single dentidrose cyst reaching larger proportions. The case reported here is considered rare because of the impacted teeth was in the mandib mandibular region and the prevalence of an erupted canine occurs more frequently in the upper canines. They also presented with the normal size with no association of traumas in the region and without loss of early deciduous elements. In addition, the dentidrose cyst was crossing the mid median line, which characterizes another variant, once it involves multiple dental elements. And the unerupted canine study is very important in dentistry, since successful results depend on correct and early diagnosis for proper management and success of the proposed treatment. Next. 
these are my references. And thank you for your attention. And thank you, Lohana. Yes. Yes. Any questions to Dr. Cleason Kivlin? Cleason Kivlin, any questions to Dr. Cleason Kivlin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for participating in this event on behalf of Forensic Chamber of Indian Dental Science as as well as Congress 2021. We want to thank you for this presentation. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your tips in front of this audience. Looking forward to meeting again next time. Thanks for taking me out of your busy schedule and joining this event. Now we invite Dr. Federico Moreno. Marcio Varela Hadesi Molo from Junior from Perambuco Federal University from Brazil to start the presentation. Yes, sir, you can start your presentation. Dr. Frederico, you can start your presentation. <clears throat> Hi everyone, can you um, see my screen? Yes, sir. It's fine. Okay, so hi again. Um, I'm here today to represent the ambulatory of maxillofacial surgery from the University of Pernambuco. And I'm going to lecture about face injury caused by dog bite. My name is Frederico Maello, Frederico Massio Varela de Melo Jr. And I have an, an as an advisor, Professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela de Mello. I'm currently a dental school student in Maurice de Nassau University in Brazil. And I'm also an intern at the Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service at the Federal University of Pernambuco. So um, to begin with the introduction, of course, the bites of most interest to the dental surgeon are caused by domestic animals, especially when it comes from dogs and cats. And canine bites are among the 12 main causes of accidental injuries to people. And these injuries are of great importance as they have a, right, a high rate of contamination and can cause, of course, in addition to serious local infections, some systemic diseases caused by bacteria, viruses, protozoan, and parasites. The dogs are responsible for 60 to 95%, and they usually occur in children and teenagers below the age of 15, mostly from the um, male gender. Now, this school, or the bones of the head collectively, if you may, is divided in two parts. The posterior part, which is called the neurocranium, which is the part of the cranium closing the brain, and the visceral cranium, which is the part that com comprises the facial bones. And if you look to the left image or the lateral view of this globe, you see that it is primarily consisting of the large and round brain case above. And also the um, upper and lower jaws as well. The areas that, that are separated by the zygomatic R and also the, I mean, the zygomatic R actually is the bony R on the side of the school 
which starts from the cheek area to the area above the ear canal. Then there is the temporal fossa and the infratemporal fossa, which are the areas above and below the zygomatic arc level. Now, the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. All of these structures are surrounded by three membranes, which are known as meninges. It is also important to know because around the temporal area, we will find the deep, the middle, and the superficial temporal arteries and veins. Now, moving on to the facial uh, nerve system. Each facial nerve supplies the muscles of the face on its own side. So loss of function in the facial nerve causes partial or even total paralysis of one side of the face. Now trauma is basically any injury caused by a mechanical or physical agent. And it can be it can be a serious injury to the body as from physical violence or an accident as well. Here we have a statistic table according to Mello in Lima in Meira, 2004, where it shows us numbers and percentages of traumas. And according to this table, uh, traffic accidents are the top reaching a number of 1692, which is 37.2% of all etiological factors. Going behind are the falls, physical aggressions, and so on. And according to the numbers of the types of physical aggressions, animal bites, as you can see, reach a number of 17, 1.6% of all the types of physical aggressions. Now, according to FRANSA 2008, animal bites are divided in four categories, first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree, each being specifically mentioned on the screen. Now, this graphic is shown in Portuguese because it's according to the Brazilian Ministry of Health and on the prophylaxis treatment for rabies. And the graphic defines uh, the, the severe accident as injuries to the head, face, neck, hands, and plantar fascia, deep multiple extensive injuries in any region of the body, Leaking of mucous membranes, late skin where there is already serious injury and injury caused by animal nail. Now, if a dog or, or a cat has suspicious has no suspicions of rabies, actually, on the moment of the attack, you must wash your hands with soap and water. Observe the animal for 10 days after exposure start prophylactic regimen with two doses on the same day and the day and the other on day three. If the animal remains healthy during the observation period, just go ahead and close the case. Now, if the animal dies, disappears, or becomes rabid, continue the prophylactic regimen, administering saline and completing the regimen up to five doses. Also apply a dose between the seventh, the tenth, and those on the days 14 and 28. If the dog or cat is suspicious of, suspicious of rabies on the moment of the attack, you must wash the area with soap and water, start the prophylactic regimen with saline solution, and five doses on vaccine on the same day, days three, 7, 14, and 28. Also observe the animal for 10 days after exposure. And if the suspicions of rabies is ruled out after the 10th day of observation, suspend the prophylactic regimen and close the case. Now, if the dog or cat has rabies, wash the area with soap and water. And start immediately the prophylactic regimen with saline solution and five doses of vaccine on the same day, days 3, 7, 14, and 28. Now, the very deep lesions, the ones, of course, reaching the muscular layer with tissue frame, 
the correct conduct is to approach the deep layers with observer threads to prevent local infections since they since they uh, become dissolved in the body fluids and disappears it leaves the skin without soldier now th the purpose is to show a case report of a patient who suffered a scalp lesion and injury to the right preoricle region here we have a, a male patient three years old he was a victim of a physical aggression by a dog of his own family, and he was taken to the emergency room at the reference hospital in Recife, state of Pernambuco, Brazil. On the regular general, general condition, he was walking, he was conscious, he was oriented, he was a febrile and eugenic. On clinical examination, on extensive, an extensive scalp wound was found, as you can see, and a laceration as well as a contusion in the right oracle um, area. He also had hemorrhage due to the rich vascularization of the scalp and lesions in the terminal por uh, portions of the uh, superficial temporal arteries. Initially, the advanced trauma life support, the TLS protocol was performed. And, and then because it was an extensive injury in a pediatric patient, the approach was performed in an operating room for cleaning, debridement, and tissue reconstruction. In the operative period, after the, uh, the patient's anesthesia, of course, the first approach performed by the team was shaving the skull, then followed by an exhaustive irrigation of, of the wounds using saline solution, 0.9%. Um, it was also, um, it was also, we also did the inspection and detailed surgical exploration of the lesion to seek the involvement of the, uh, the deep structures and performing the removal of foreign bodies, which is very important from that area specifically. The um, also exhaustive cleaning was, uh, cleaning of the wound was performed with the aid of um, uh, the um, mandolovium brush and 10% uh, polyvinyl pyridone iodine solution. And also as well as uh, the debridement of devitalized tissues. And after the, 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 the cleaning and debridement, the, the nature of the lesion was observed. The animal, the, the small fractures in this external bone cortex of the skull cap and loss of tissue substance. Now during the operative period, after the patient's anesthesia, I mean, I'm sorry, um, after actually the post-operative, the, the best treatment plan was decided to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct the tissues, rotating flaps to close the areas with loss of substances followed by primary closure of the lesions through soldier and non-absorbable threads on the monon island type 4.0 and, and 5.0. Anti-rabies prophylaxis was necessary in the patient, but the need for tetanus prophylaxis was not because he was already vaccinated. Now, finally, the dog was observed for 10 days without presenting any behavioral uh, changes. And at the hospital level, the patient's venoclysis was maintained by performing an algesic therapeutic protocol using antibiotic therapy with cephalithin and uh, metronidazole and also the use of corticosteroids. And after seven days, the soldier was removed and no posture, no posture post-operative complications were observed. This right here is the post-operative after four years. As, as we can see, and the patient is in perfect condition. You can also see the uh, symmetry. There is a scar tissue right on his forehead, but it can only be seen if the patient raises his hair. Now, the animal bite wounds are treated a little different since they have saliva rich in microbiota, being highly susceptible to infection. And as for the need for uh, prophylaxis on the human rabies, the patient should be referred to a specialized service. 
and the dog should be kept isolated from other individuals and animals. These are my references. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Any questions to Doctor Frederico Marcio? Any questions? Just if you have any questions, you can text in chat box. We'll be asking here for you even after the completion of the conference. I think no questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for participating in this event. We thank you for the presentation. On behalf of the Organized Committee Member of Dental Science as well as Oral Health Congress 2021, we want to thank for this impression. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meet again next time. Everything goes with well physical events. Even after the, this COVID-19, after uh, going with this pandemic here. Now we ask Dr. Maria Luisa L.V. Slins from Federal University of Paranbock from Brazil to start the presentation. Actually, we are around 30 minutes ahead of the program, so we can manage. So we ask you to take your own time for presentation. Hi, can you please available my share screen? So we don't have your PPT, madam. Just you can share to your friends. They'll be playing via for. Will you share to uh, to our email, uh, WhatsApp number so that so that I can receive it immediately? It's not working here. Just to be on that. You just you can just send you the WhatsApp number. Just you can send to immediately. Shall we take five, five minutes break and uh, we'll join again? Meanwhile, you can, you'll be submitting your abstract. Uh, sorry, four point two. Me, I will play. Is it okay with you? Just five minutes break. We do have more, in, uh, two more talks, including your talk. I mean, sorry, three talks, including your talk. Yeah. So I request all the participants to take just a five minutes break and we'll join short by 5.35 according to IST timings. Actor Dr. Maria is going to send the PPT. Hope you understand everybody. Thank you.
హలో డాక్టర్ హలో డాక్టర్ మరియా లూయిస్ జస్ట్ యూ కెన్ సెండ్ టు జస్ట్ వి హ్యావ్ సెండ్ yes i already sent just do you are you playing from your side are you going to play share from your side you can see the yeah. screen yes yes it's fine so can i start yes just just we need to wait 2 minutes more because we need to follow the timing okay so, yeah actually we are around 30 minutes ahead of the program due to this us speaker has not yet joining it's midnight to them can i start yes ma'am you can start okay good morning for you all my name is maria luisa vislins and i am here to present a case report named resection of metatypical basal cell carcinoma with self grafting reconstruction test please next So these are my co-authors. Next. And here I present to you the leader of our service, the professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela, Iris de Melo. Next. I am a dentistry student from the Federal University of Pernambuco and also I am an intern at the ambulatory of the maxillofacial surgery. and traumatology service of the Federal University of Pernambuco too. I am a member of the social project is named Prevention and Treatment of Cancer in Face and Mouth Regions in Venturosa, Pernambuco, Brazil, and at the project named Use of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Treatment of Patients with Temporomandibular Disorders. Next. Next, please. So anatomically speaking, you can pass. Our skin will have structures and will be composed of the epidermis and the dermis, which is formed by a dense conjunctival tissue not modulated. And we will also have the epidermis, which is a keratin keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that will be divided in four regions. This entire sequence of regions are named thick skin and fine skin. You can pass. Pass, please. The fine skin will be found of all over of our body and the thick skin in other hand is typically found on the soles of the feet on the palms on the elbows and also on the knees next histologically uh, the thick skin has a thick epidermis formed by many cells and also a thick keratinized area next you can pass and different from the other in the fine skin the epidermis is thin with not too much cells as we can see in this image so talking about the basal cell carcinoma Kumar Abbas and Esther says that the carcinoma are the malignant neoplasms that has origin in the epithelial cells derived from every of the three germ layers and it's from them that the BCC is found. Pass please. 
So the basal cell carcinoma constitutes the most of called non-melanoma skin cancers, and this type of carcinoma is the most frequently cancer in human in Brazil and worldwide. Only in the United States we have an incidence of estimated of 2.7 million of cases per year. But in general, the metastasis rarely occurs, fortunately. You can pass. Despite the basal cell rarely causes metastasis, luckily it can be destructive and it's an important research for morbidities for patients, especially when it's located on the face. Next. The pathogenesis of basal cell carcinoma is believed to be multifactorial with the influence of the ultraviolet uh, radiation. And there are other risk factors like skin pigmentation, immune suppression, uh, scares, genetic syndromes, the exposure to arsenio and hydrocarbons, and also the ultraviolet or the ionized radiation. Next. So this pathology is more common in Caucasian population. The incidence rate is approximately 30% higher in men than women. The most affected patients are usually the middle or the old age uh, patients. 8% of the basal cell carcinoma are located on the head and the neck. And usually they are uh, localized at the auricular, the nose, the periocular uh, regions. And they will also have a slow and progressive growth. And it's uh, usually asymptomatic. You can pass. So clinically, how it will appear? Will appear in only one way? Not really. Pass, please. Actually, will appear in various aspects. It can be appears like popos, like ulcerations, plates, atrophy, and infiltration. You can pass. So they have common characteristics clinically visualized, like the friable injuries that can blend with friction and torturous irregular blood vessels on the surface. Decoloration can usually appear pearly, reddish, whitish, light brown, or dark or black when it's the pigmented type of basal cell carcinoma. For the best treatment and prognosis, the histopathological exam, the local, the local of the, the lesion and the size of this lesion will be essential. The reason of this is because it can be subdivided in six types of basal cell carcinoma with different clinical behaviors. So we're gonna have the superficial the nodular, the micronodular, the infiltrate, the scleroderm form, and also the metatypical type. There will be also subdivided in groups according to aggressiveness. And as one of the aggressive types, we have here the metatypical type, which, we, which are our case report. So the aggressive group has also some comes characteristics. They're gonna have uh, increased cell necrosis, a uh, mitotic activity with less stroma proliferation, a uh, deep growth, and less circumscription. Talk more specifically about our kind of basal cell carcinoma. 
the metatypical basal cell carcinoma is considered an unusual type with an aggressive clinical behavior, and it's not considered a fatal pathology, but if it's diagnosed late, it can become a challenge. They, will, they are subdivided in two groups. So we're going to have the mixed one and the intermediate. And this kind is also associated with even distance metastasis. The most likely locus of metastasis are the lungs, the bones, and the lymph nodes. It can also be disseminated by the sanguine flow and also the lymphatic flow. About the recurrency, the metatypical BCC are associated with increasing recurrences, and that's why it's so important to have the patient monitored and ensure uh, sufficient margins, margins uh, during the resection. Histologically, it's characterized by areas of differentiations with the presence of cells with eosinophilic cytoplasms and areas of keratinization. And also we're gonna have the peripheral basal cells will still maintain their perisade apparatus. According to Vidrio and collaborators stud, the metatypical is hairy and will be showing up only 7% of the cases. In other hand, Bancillaris studs shows a percentage of 50% of the cases. Therefore, the characteristic of the metatypical is widely debated in the literature. About the difference Differential diagnosis, we will have a several types of difference diagnosis, and that's why it's so important to have the confirmation at the histopathological exam. The treatment of the metatypical BCC can be surgical or non-surgical for the metastatic, metastatic ones or the deepest ones can be used the vasmodegib or and others inhibitors. The surgical treatment counts with four possibilities. So we're gonna have the excision, the cryosurgery, the mi micrographic of most technique and curating and cautery uh, technique. The excision is considered the most uh, global high cure. In cases of deep infiltration, you, we can also associate the surgical treatment plus the radiotherapy or amputation of the affected region to avoid future metastasis. When you have a case of a surgical incision from carcinomas and pathologies in general, it's, no, it's important to know about graft to rehabilitate this patient. So graft in Portuguese, it's a masculine noun and is defined by the act of grafting or inserting any tissue or natural organ that is implanted from one part to other. To understand about the graft, we have to know that we need a donor area and a receiving area, which will provide both function and aesthetics. So we're gonna have four types of graft. Uh, the first one, we have the autograft. It's when the donor and the receiver are the same person. Secondly, we're gonna have the isograft. It's when the donor and the receiver are univitellinical twins. Also, we're gonna have the 
allograft, that is when the donor and the receiver are from the same species but are different people. And the last one, we're going to have the channel graph that is when the donor and the receiver are from different species. So the options can be grafting in total or partial parts. In the partial graft, we will take the epidermis and part of the dermis, different from the total graft, where we can take the structures like the epidermis, the dermis, the hair follicle, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, vascular plexus, and nervous plexus. So knowing this, the objective of this article is to report a case report of resection of metatypical basal cell carcinoma with self-grafting reconstruction. About our case report, we have here a female patient, 77 years old, Leucodan, who sought our service at the Federal University of Pernambuco, reporting a wood in the right parasymphysis areas. In the anamnesis, the patient reported that she lived in the countryside of the state of Pernambuco and also was in constant sun exposure to the work she performs. She also reported the time of the lesion, which was three years old. Pass, please. Again, on the extra oral clinical examination, you can you can back please. On the extra oral clinical examination, we saw a pearly asymmetrical and ulcerated wood in the paracephasis area. After the examinates the anamnesis, this patient uh, was decided to perform an incisional bi biopsy to prove the hypothesis diagnosis. The biopsy has a corroborative result for metatypical basal cell carcinoma. So after the result exams were were submitted for this patient. So we passed for her the X-ray exams, the laboratory exams, the electrocardiogram, and also the cardiological uh, considerate. Then this patient was submitted for a total resection of the lesion and an autograph repair under the general anesthetic anesthesia at the Hospital das Clinicas of the Federal University of Pernambuco. During the surgery, firstly, was performed the complete resection of the entire wood using a scalpel and a, a number 11 blade. And as we can see, the resection was performed respecting the safety areas that are five millimeters from the lateral borders and one millimeters from the diff. In this image, we can also see the cauterization of the blood vessels. In the second image, subsequently, uh, using a sterile paper, the receiving area and the donor area, uh, the pectoral area, were demarked with borders and contour totally equivalent to the receiving area. Pass, please. With also a uh, scalp and a uh, dissection clip, the excision was made in the pectoral region, obeying the demarcate borders and follow, followed by the removal of the autograph key flap. Pass, please. So the autograph was immediately placed in the receiving area, preserving the tissue anatomy and health. After the place of the graft was performed a uh, suture with to the advanced tissue with separated stitches, stitches using the 5.0 mononylotrid 
and the co-optation of the tissue borders of the donor area was made by a continuous intradermal suture with a 6.0 mononylon treat. The patient was hospitalized for 72 hours and the surgical specimen was sent to the anatomopathological laboratory of the Hospital des Clinicas of our university and was confirmed the free borders of the surgical specimen and also was confirmed the diagnosis of metatypical basal uh, cell carcinoma due the microscopically presence of cells with more eosinophilic cytoplasm and keratinization areas. And we also can see the predominance of the, please come back, of the atypical keratinizated ischemos type, uh, as you can see in this image. The postoperative was eventually, and after 15 days, this patient um, came back to the stitch removal at our service place. The case was followed up for a period of five years. And ha as we can see here, the patient has total tissue adaptation in the previously injured area and with a good healing and a for, for favorable aesthetics without any signal of recurrence. So for my final speech, uh, I would like to say that the patient showed total tissue adaptation in previously injured area with favorable prognostics. And despite the extent, the extent of Alternative treatment surgical resection was the choice of the, the team as the best option based on the chance of recurrences of this pathology. So removing the injury tissues and safe borders and performing the autograph to reduce the damages, uh, returning the aesthetics and the function for this patient. So these are my references, you can pass. And I would like to thank you all, firstly, for the invitation and for all this event. If you have any questions, any doubts or any curiosity, you can send me to my email. It will be a pleasure to answer you. Thank you. Yes, any questions? Any questions to Dr. Maria Luisa? No questions, madam. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you very much, madam, for participating in this event. On behalf of our organizing committee member of Dental Science as well as Pura Health, Health Congress 2021, we want thank you for that. And uh, yes, thank you very much for your nice speech. This was a great video. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Now we ask Dr. Ana Luis Silvia from Federal University of Pernambuco from Brazil to start the presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, madam. You can go. On. Hello everyone, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, today we're talking about the surgical resection of pleomorph carcinoma. It's a case report from the Ambulatory of Maximo Facial Surgery and Traumatology from the Federal University of Pernambuco. These are all my co-authors and you can pass please. And as the surgeon responsible for this case, we have the professor and Dr. Ricardo Genio Parella, Iris de Mello. 
So my name is Ana Luisa Engelbert Silva, and I'm an undergraduate student of dentistry at the University, Federal University of Pernambuco. And also I'm an intern at the Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery Salves of the Federal University of Pernambuco too. So I began my presentation point that the oral and maxillofacial system is a part of a very complex anatomic region. When we talk about this area and all the conditions that affect the teeth, their support structures, and the dysfunction of the temporal mandibular joint, we will have the dentistry responsible for that. However, neurologists, otorhinolaryngologists, and oncologists also need to have an excellent knowledge uh, of the disorders in this region to be able to provide a safer diagnosis of systemic disease that manifests themselves through oral lesions. So, uh, the pleomorph cadenoma is a mixed benign tumor classified as the most common benign neoplasm of the salivary glands. It is diagnosed between 53 to 72% of cases in the submandibular gland from 33 to 41% when it occurs in the mineral salivary glands and between 50 to 77 in the parotid gland. It can affect any age group, but it mainly affects individuals between 30 and 60 years of age. Even with these epidemiological characteristics, it is considered as the most common salivary gland neoplasm in children. And it has a predilection for the female gender. Pass, please. It consists of ductal element concomitantly with myoepithelial extractors and will present a very large microscopic diversity. In other words, uh, neoplasm will be different for each other microscopically, even if it's the same tumor. Exactly for this reason, this pathology will present unusual characteristics, like, oh, you can pass please, Clinically, clinically, we can see a solid, firm, lobulated, and mobile mass with well-defined mass and paleness on palpation. They have a slow and asymptomatic growth, which is why they are usually found only in routine examination. When it affects the parotid gland, mainly in its superficial lobe, it causes an increase in the branch of the mandible, and it it's, is usually one-sided. The patient may experience pain and facial paralysis, but it's hurt. How do most pleomorph cardinoma are benign? A small fraction can show an aggressive onset. This situation can occur as a consequence of constant recurrence and radiotherapies. When malignant, they can be classified into three types, like X, X, pleomorph adenoma carcinoma, carcinosarcoma, and pleomorph cardinoma metastasis. For the diagnosis of this pathology, the clinical analysis is very important, but radiographic examination have a great benefit. The tasks that we can use for the diagnosis are ultrasound, cytography, tomography, and magnetic resonance. Um, the delimitation of the extension of the adenoma is best described by the magnetic resonance imaging as it reveals the multinodular nature of the disease. Histologically, it is encapsulated and well circumscribed with is uh, and he and it have a parenchyma formed by a granular epithelium plus myoepithelial cells. The treatment of choice is surgical. Parotidectomy is indicated when it affects the superficial lobe of the parotid. Since this choice facilitates the preservation and identification of the facial name. Uh, the surgical approach of choice include the 
intraoral incision and the histo incision. And when the surgeon opts for the patient resection, it will increase the chance of recursion. So we can have um, a case report about a female patient with 29 years old who was attended by the maxillofacial surgery and traumatology staff of the Federal University of Pernambuco complain of an increased volume in the left submandibular region. Clinical examination revealed a uh, well delimited left parotidal region lesion present with a firm and painless consistency. So, in this image, in the, the first image, we can see a uh, front view, preoperative, and in the second image, a uh, left side view of the preoperative tube. So, can pass. In order to provide a complete diagnosis, a cervical ultrasonography was requested. It exhibited a well-delimited motonoculate lesion, as you can see in this image, with a 10 to 4 centimeter of size. An aspiration biopsy was performed, which confirmed the diagnosis of pleomorph carinoma. And for this reason, the treatment of choice was was surgical to completely remove the tumor. You can pass, please. Firstly, the incision of choice was the HISDO incision, or we can, we can talk like submandibular incision, followed by a myocutaneous flap designation and differentiation of the platysma muscle. You can pass. In this image, we can see the identification of the platysma muscle. Yes. After the blood vessels hemostatis, the tumor resection was performed along with the interior lobe of the left parotid. We can pass. In this image, we can see the identification of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the intradermal skin was suturated at separate points, and the cutaneous suture was intermediately continuous. Sorry. And the surgical specimen was sent to the patholo pathological laboratory. You can pass. So histologically, the, the pathology presents cells proliferation with epithelial, uh, epithelial differentiation being morphologically cuboid or basaloid, arranges in sheets, cords, and ductiform structures. Mio epithelial different uh, cells present with fusiform and plasma cytoid morphology. And when locate ducts in peripheral areas, they exhibit clear cytoplasm. It's, uh, it's characteristic by um, glaucoma of carinoma. You can pass. We observe the, the absence of the postoperative complication and the suture removal was performed after the six days, seven days, and the patient's follow-up occurred. And in this, in the first image, you can see the, the preoperative front view. In the second image, we can see the postoperative front view. You can pass. In that slide, you can see in the first image, the preoperative left side view. In the second image, we can see the postoperative left side view. In conclusion, the plum of carinoma can pass is a benign tumor with diverse characteristics. The surgical technique choice depends on the deep of the lesion, its extension, and its health relation with the facial nerve. You can pass. Those were all of my bibli bibliographical reference. And it can pass. Here's my contact and the contact details of the service that I am part of. Thank you all. Yes. Any questions? Any questions to Dr. Bruna and Luisa? Sorry. 
Ana Luisa. Any questions, Dr. Ana Luisa, Luisa, Sylvia? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for participating in this event. Thank you. Yes, on behalf of Organizing Committee Member of Dental Science as well as Oral Health Congress 2021, we want to thank you for your participation. Thanks for sharing your tips with us. Looking forward to meeting you next time. Now we have Dr. Bruna Luisa Foster from University Center of Physics from Brazil to start the presentation. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, I'm good afternoon. Do you see my screen? Yes, madam, it's fine. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruna Mello, and I will present about surgical treatment for maxillary sinusitis using the Caldwell Loop technique. I'm Bruna Mello again. So, below my name, the name of my friends and co authors of this work. And I have a, a professor and advisor of this work, Professor Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela Ayrgemello. And about me, I'm a dentist school academic in University Center for Sex and Seventh Period, Brazil. Currently, an Internet of Ambulatory of Maxillofacial Surgery and Traumatology Service at the Federal University of Pernambuco. As a member of the project to care of patients with oral disease and facial traumas, project intitled Prevention and Treatment of Cancer in Face and Mount Areas in Venturosa, Pernambuco, Brazil, and use traditional Chinese medicine and treatment of patients with temporomandibular disorders. So for introduction, maxillary sinusitis is a pathology characterized by an inflammation or infection reaction of the mucous membrane of the mucose. And odontogenic origin is found in about 5% to 10% of cases. Causes of odontogenic sinusitis are caries, iatrogenic cystis, and period, periodontal diseases. diseases. So maxillary sinusitis is also defined by as a pathology located in the maxillary sinus or antrum of characterized by an inflammatory reaction or infection of this mucus of the sinus. So in this mesh, you guys can observe an instrument coming out of the alveoli of the tooth and entering exactly in the maxillary sinus. So this resulting in a dental infection. So some symptoms of sinusitis of odontogenic origins are similar to no odontogenic, odontogenic ones, like a nasal obstruction or congestion with the presence of yellowish secretion, facial pain or pressure, and redex. I'm sorry. So also we can say that, sorry. Also, we can say that symptoms of this type of sinusitis are non-specific and poorly located as infra or supraorbital redactions. Headaches, so, I'm sorry. Um, so this is an example image. You guys can see the breasts are internally lining by a thin and delicate membrane called the chinidae membrane. 
So with the globet and serous mucus producing glands, this mucus consists on water, 95 to 97%. Um, mucin 2.5 to 3% and electrolytes 1 to 2%, which are plays an important immune to defense diffusion. This is another example image. Um, you guys can observe in the red arrow the compromised headed breast and in the blue arrow this area, um, the normally of the maxillary sinus. This is a compromised, and this one blue is a normally. So the modified caudal look approach consists of making a bone window in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. The technique is feasible and appropriate for maxillary sinus brings a benefit of closure of the defect avoids fistulas and fibrous in the membrane. This is another example image. Um, you guys can observe the landmakers. Um, the arrow read the side of window, premolars and upper canine. This is another one, uh, like a real image you can see the assess of window, like the technique. So let's start the case report. Um, a five, seven year old female patient, leukoderma attended the buccomaxillofacial surgery and traumatology on clinic of Federal University of Pernambuco, complained about the absence of dental elements in which she reported that she lost as younger due infections to infections and inflammatory process. Constant um, presence of purulent secretion leaving in the nasal region of constant pain in the middle third of the face region. So this imagining examination showed the absence of multiple dental elements with two teeth included one in the anterior area, uh, region of the right maxilla, and the other in the posterior region of the left mandible, with radiolution image involving the crowns, the crowns with the diagnostic hypothesis of dentigeral cysts. There are singly radiopaque on homogeneous and dome-shaped change located on the floor of the maxillary sinus. Saying this to panoramic radiograph, homogeneous dome-shaped image in the left maxillary sinus. Um, this is an area of choice of tra trapezoidal incision on um, this technique chosen for enucleation of the cystic and maxillary sinus was the Caldwell look surgical technique. Two trapezoidal incisions uh, were made, one at the, at the right of upper lip break, associated with the other incision in the alveolar crest of the left molar region, followed by detriment of mucoperiosal flap This is a sex a sex of window and the maxillary sinus cavity. So with the maxilla exposed, an osteotomy and osteotomy was performed uh, above the dental alveoli and the anterior wall of maxillary sinus, creating an um, deuterial wall of the window for the sinus entrum. Curitage, cystis and ampudent and ambulant irrigation with 0.9%. Any ACUI was performed with diluted and with cephalexin. And from this moment, it's made against opening in the maxillary sinus. 
it is inflammatory or infected, it has bleed a lot. So it's very necessary to act, act quick, quickly. Um, then this is a necessary with a curie test to scrape and the tear maxillary sinus so that the blending goes away. So the saline use it to help to identify if everything is clean. Um, in the upper part of maxillary sinus, there is an infraorbital nerve and it may be inside at maxillary sinus. So there's a need to be very careful, very important this. So a 20 milliliter steering is used to with saline in the gradual irrigation um, you think this completely clean. So it's going to help. Um, before suturing the mucoperiosal flap with the mono nylon 5.03, a nasal opening was performed to place and fix a drain for irrig irrigation and aspiration, preventing the formation of clothes and hematomas. So to close the excess of window, wholesale plastic um, replacing two of the vestibular mucoperiosal flap and subsequent suture of the upper alveolar margin was performed. So this is a suture of the producing and, and it's finished. At the end of surgery, um, Antibiotic therapy analgesics were prescribed, and the patient was instructed to she needs an she need uh, oral e hygiene. Um, she's remained off, off, hospitalized for 48 hours, and the drain was removed with you, without decoration or any type of prosperity. I'm sorry on prosperity, on control. So the suture was removed 10 days after surgery and this patient was instructed to undergo prosperative control. And three months after this period and, and do do and well. Um, the sample was sent for histopathological analysis as the laborator laboratory of pathology of the same institution for confirm conf confirmation of the diagnosis. And as a spec of the result of the bio biopsy was compatible with the initial diagnosis. So the Caldwell look for this case, um, the caudal look technique was chosen for enucleation of the retention cysts in patients, um, left maxillary sinus and consequent removal of sinus mucosa. Because according to Rod Rod Rodriguez, it's a author, um, only caudal look offers the advantages of eliminating all the cough. Um, and jury on ruling or the possibility of reconciling of the condition. So, as the patient's sinus was resulting on infected dental elements, that's its odontogenic origin. And the Caldwell look produces for cystic nucleation and total sinusectomy of left maxillary sinus, especially because the producers preserve the anatomy and the maxillary sinus. This is a fact imposed by Heather as a, the one serious problems. And he's another author. So it can be understood that correct diagnosis is will throat elevation. And of complementary tests, it's essential for patients undergoing surgical intervention who have any type of lesion. This is my reference. And for finally, I would like to thank everyone for watching and wishing a lot of health and protection for everyone. Thank you so much.
you guys have a questions, I'm here. It's mute. The microphone. Me, your audio is mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, it's okay. Please, please apologize. Yes, you have got a question, uh, a compliment from Dr. Julia Peck. So beautiful. Thank you, Bruna. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you see me? <laughs> yes, madam. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. For speaking up in this conference on behalf of our organizing committee on data science as well as oral health congress 2021 we want to thank you for your presentation thanks thank you for sh sharing your tips with us looking forward to meet again next time now we invite Hello. the last yes now we invite the last speaker of this conference will be dr julia this house back from our CEO. <laughs> also, University from Brazil to start the presentation. Okay, so hello everyone, good afternoon. I am Julia Beck and I'm going to present about traumatic neuroma, impacted third molar, and the use of computed tomography for evaluation of lower alveolar nerve analysis of the literature and case report. So that's my co authors and I have a uh, advisor, the professor, Dr. Ricardo Eugenio Varela, Aires de Melo. And here is a, a little bit about me. I am Julia Souza Beck Dental School Academic in Mauricio de Nassau University, Brazil. Currently an intern uh, ambulatory maxillofacial surgery and traumatology service at the Federal University of Pernambuco and as a member of the project to care of patients with oral diseases and facial traumas. The project intitled Prevention as a Treatment of Cancer in Face and Mouth Areas in Venturosa, Pernambuco, Brazil, and the use of traditional Chinese medicine in the treatment of patients with temporomandibular diseases. So before we start the case report, I will, I will talk a little bit about a little bit more about the jaw so we can understand more about it. The jaw is the only moving bone on the face. It's old and hostile shaped. The teeth 38 and 48 are the lower third molars. And this region you can see here uh, is located the third molar. So in some cases, the rule of the third molar reaches uh, here. So you can be identified before the exodont here. The traumatic neuroma is caused due to the proliferation of a nerve consequent to a rupture of ligaments of the surgery or any injury to the head and neck region. It is uh, diagnosed above all in the middle age or and shows a predilection for the female sex. So clinically, it's present as uh, a firm nodule, so painful that is usually seen the area of the Newtonian foramen, tongue, and lower lip. So the extraction of third molars is frequent, especially when it comes to the lack of space in them. The inferior skin may be related to lower alveolar nerve. And uh, during surgery, however, the use of complementary imaging tests is essential as prevention. 
The lower alveolar nerve is a branch of the mandibular nerve, which the third branch, V3, of the fifth cranial part, the trigeminal nerve, and it then innervates the incisors, canines, cranulars, and lower molars. It's subdivided into branches, mentonian, incisor, oral, temporal, and lingual artery. And the anatomy, the nerve is in the lower dental canal, which is included the inside dense bone tube, and the tube is in radiographics, like here, and two lines radiopack parallels, one representing the roof of the canal and the other the, the floor of the canal. So the third molars are the last teeth to form in our mouth. We have four, two upper and two lower, okay, that are born hands only and are located behind all the other teeth at the end of the dental arcs on both sides. And this image, we can visualize a computer tomography to identify the third molars. So therefore, it's noted the importance of effective uh, and accurate radiographic evaluation before extractions of the third molars in order to avoid complications during surgery. Among the most used complementary tests are panoramic radiographies and tomographies, but with the, they are the specific indications for different situations. Okay, so the panoramic is very useful in identifying the anatomical variations presented by mandibular canal. On the other hand, tomography is more efficient because it provides the image with a lower degree of distortion and three-dimensional in action, it has a lower radiation dose. Sorry, I'm back. Okay, so sorry. Here we can see a panoramic image that shows everything, but the tomography is still better. You know, so to identify the proximity between the nerve and third molar. The technological develop, development uh, of this has provided a good evaluation of anatomical proximity between the third molars and lower alveolar nerve. Among the most used complementary tests are the panoramic radiographies and tomographies with their specific indications for different situations. So the objective of this study is to report a case of patient who developed traumatic neuroma in the right mandibular region of the exodontia of third molars. So the case report was a female patient, 26, so the ambulatory of maxillofacial surgery and traumatology service at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil, reporting loss of sensitivity of the right lower lip. So during the analysis, the patient reported that she had undergone an exercise surgery of impacted teeth three years ago. On imagine the panoramic examination, uh, it presents hepatary of the right alveolar nerve associated with a radiolucent mouse. So there is a hepatary or section of the vascular nerve bundle during the surgery. The nerve was hepatary, lost the, the vitality, but could have been Avoid in the surgeon had made the connection of the hepatary nerves. For there was a great possibility to return the vitality since Schwann cells would do this part. So 
through the phenomenon called neuroentropism. The richness of details of computer tomography helps in the diagnosis. So it's the patient, okay. So these are real images of the female patient showing this part where she presents the neuroma. Here we can analyze the, the size of the neuroma. We can visualize better. So the patient underwent uh, incisional biopsy confirming the diagnosis of traumatic neuroma. In this figure, we can see a disorder proliferation of the encapsulated nerve bundles in a dense collagen matrix. On the arrow red, we can see the collagen, and on the black, we can see the regenerate nerve fascia, fascicle, sorry. So the blade was used in metoxylone and using enlarged by 100 times. So the conclusion was the computer tomography evaluation is so important to highlight the nerves and thereby not injury then during extraction. It has been the most effective misery from today and consists the correct diagnosis, anatomical and technical knowledge of this professional. The patient wondering an uh, incision of biopsy confirming the diagnosis of traumatic neuroma and therefore is noted the importance of effective and accurate radiographic and to diagnosis, to confirming the diagnosis of neuroma, traumatic neuroma. So it's noted to importance in order to avoid complications uh, during the surgery. Here are my references and thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, any questions? Any questions for Dr. Julia Beck? I think no questions. No. Yes. No. <laughs> yes, madam. Thank you so much for watching. Yes. So you got a Comment from Dr. Lima. Congratulations, Julia. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Slowly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for participating in this event. On behalf of Organizing Committee Member of Dental Science Congress 2021, we want to thank you for your presentation. Looking forward to meeting again next time. Yes. We hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions answered, answered during this event, you can share through email. Within the next day, next one hour, two days, you'll be getting the answers. If you go to vote of thanks, thank you very much to all the participants, those who joined this webinar on second, yes, second virtual webinar on dental science as well as oral health congress 2021 during this pandemic period, having with the different time zones. Our most sincere thank to all the keynote speakers, plenary speakers, delegates journal collaborators, media partners who have joined from dis different destinations around the globe for this support and cooperation. Let us thank speakers who have responded so well to our invitation to participate in this conference. We have received several papers which will inform the basis of our discussion in the various sessions. Let us thank you all for associating within this conference by your presence. A special thanks to program manager, Ms. Elena Watson for her continuous effort in putting us all together in one platform in this online event. The EPNOP keynote speakers lecturer from Dr. Aishwarya Khadu as well as Dr. Priyanka Tiwari. If you go to session speakers, Dr. Shan Shantala Malikarjuna, Dr. Jayapriya Jayakumar, Dr. Lohana Mehlin Dilima, Dr. Klesin Kelvin, Dr. Federico, Dr. Maria Elvis Lin, Dr. Camila Sikivira, Dr. Ana Luisa, Dr. Bruna Costa, Dr. Julia Dibuk. 
if you go to one delegate will participating in this conference that is dr now i don't know the mr gomez will be the dr now if you go if everything goes well in 2022 hope we will join in physical event on same topic that will be dental industry as well as oral health congress a special thank to thankful to federal university of pernambuco brazil as well as morcio the nossa university from brazil as well as university center fasix university center of fake all fasol as well as university of dundee from uk to joining this event i would like to thank participants hope you collaborate in future events in physical or or, as, or else in virtual events electronic certificate as well as uh, ebook will be sent through email within 2 to 3 working days after the completion of the conference if i have any questions please let me know so that we can close in this ceremony i mean the conference any questions madam <laughs> just you can uh, text in chat box will be uh, just i'll i'll convey all these messages to my committee members immediately they'll be answering you all the questions i am very special thank to all the participants during this pandemic year we are going in through online events yes finally we extend our appreciation to each of you for participating in this online conference thanking you have a nice day bye bye this is signing off madhu bhupati thank you all bye <laughs> yes thank you have a nice day it's already so, uh, 6:30 in indian time i don't know brazil <laughs> thank you thank you very much madam have a nice day bye thank you thank you thank you